Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the collaborating webinar of the South African Institute of Electrical Engineers, University of Johannesburg, and the Water Research Commission. Today, day one, towards the establishment of Southern African Water Pool. Before we start a few webinar considerations, attendees are reminded to ensure the volume is turned up on your device. Ensure you have a stable internet connection. This will ensure the streaming and audio will run smoothly. Attendees can ask questions via the questions panel located within the GoToWebinar control panel. And by default, the control panel is located on the right-hand side of your screen. <clears throat> the chat function is reserved for webinar organizers and panelists to communicate with attendees. Attendees will not be able to chat with each other, however, are encouraged to ask questions. A recording of this webinar will be made available on the SAIEE YouTube channel, SAIEE TV. You will find the registration link in the chat box. Please click on that and register so you will receive notification once we've uploaded the recording of this webinar sessions. A certificate of attendance will be issued a few weeks after this webinar once we have received the CPD validation number from EXA. I'd like to introduce you now to our keynote speaker this morning, Professor Pat Naidu. Prof Naidu is a visiting scholar in the Department of Mechanical Engineering Science and Professor of Practice in the Faculty of Engineering and the Built Environment at the University of Johannesburg. He's a fellow of the South African Academy of Engineers, a fellow of the South African Institute of Electrical Engineers, a senior member of IEEE USA, a member of IET in UK, and Sigre in France. He is a registered professional engineer and a specialist consultant in electrical engineering, electrical energy, and power systems. Over to you, Prof Naidu. Thank you, Minx. Thank you. And good morning. Good morning, colleagues. Uh, let me share with you my screen. You're going to make me share, Minx? Is that coming through? Yes, we're just waiting for present. Here we go. Perfect. Oh, perfect. Thank you. Thank you, colleagues, and uh, good morning and welcome. And thank you for your time this morning. Uh, firstly, let me extend uh, to the leadership, management, and membership and employees of the South African Institute of Electrical Engineers, the Water Research Commission, I'm Genny Water, and our colleagues in the Southern African Power Pool, SADC and at the city of Johannesburg's Joburg Market for their input and contribution towards this strategic conversation. Uh, on behalf of our chairman of the Industry Advisory Board and our Dean, Professor Daniel Mashau, we welcome you to the proceedings in terms of day one, two, and three of the uh, virtual symposium dedicated towards a conversation on water security as driven by Industrial Revolution 4.0. Colleagues, we are grappling with South Africa's triple challenge, inequality, unemployment, poverty. And again, we're grappling with these challenges in, a, in an environment that is rapidly changing on us, that of climate, that of technology. And again, going forward, the key research question we've put on the table is, how do we reset our thinking in terms of providing water and sanitation security for all? That is our challenge. Professor Francois Engel Engelbrecht of the University of Witwatersrand Global Change Institute has forecast in terms of the work that they are doing that in the next 10 to 20 years, we are going to see some serious tipping points in the country. Day zero drought event in Gauteng, long term drought, a complete collapse of the South African maize and cattle industry. And there goes your carbohydrates and protein, killer heat waves. Category four or five cyclones coming off the Mozambique Channel. So, so there's some serious stuff happening in the environment. And again, it's going to be extreme volatility. Either having zero rainfall or infinite rainfall, all the water that you could get. So a very traditional and conventional approach to managing water resources would be to go and build the dams, the pump stations, the pipelines, etc. But how do you do this in an in extreme volatility uh, environment? zero rainfall, infinite rainfall. So we put it on the table a very much a new new reset of thinking, a new approach. Can we 
bring together the forces of markets, big data, and cash flows? Can we bring that to, to, to bear and to, and to facilitate the workings at our various water utilities and water boards? Can we get investor finance technology-driven solutions, both to provide water and sanitation security for all with, res with resilience? We want to embrace all water resources, fresh, clean, use sanitation, industrial, virtual, local, cross-border, and the oceans. Can we bring this to market? And we've learned from our colleagues at the Southern African Power Pool. You do not have to own the electrical energy, neither own the power stations or the transmission and distribution networks. You don't have to take any responsibility for any capital or operating commitments. But at the end of the day, you take your trade as market commission. And currently, SAP is enjoying an annual commission exceeding a million US dollars. Can we bring together all the water resources in the region, in Southern Africa, and trade those resources amongst ourselves? Can we, can we do it? And those are the questions we are asking ourselves. The second learning we've taken from our colleagues at the Joburg Fresh Produce Market. Again, the market does not own the farms or the trucks or the distribution networks. And again, the market takes no accountability or responsibility for any of the commitments associated with capital, infrastructure, or operations and maintenance. But again, the market commission is now approaching, now exceeding 0 0.5 billion annually. So, so can we can we learn from these examples that that we 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 can interact with? And again, water trading could potentially become a venue for us. The fresh water market could become a reality. Can we develop it? And, and there's opportunity for us in terms of taking this forward. And that's why we've invited you. Join us in strategic conversation. We will plan an international conference and exposition sometime in 2024. And under the leadership of Francis Masawi, uh, Dr. George Zibanda, and Professor Rudolf Michael, we've put three tables, three assignments on the table. Can we develop the Southern African water pool market? Can we develop the municipal freshwater market? Can we strengthen the nexus of food within the water and energy sectors? And we hope that over the next two days, we're going to get some answers and some contributions in terms of this journey forward. I'm of the view that water is the thread that connects man to the environment. And again, I'm also of the view that man has the intellectual capital to strengthen the thread that connects us to the environment. And let's see best how we could bring our ideas, knowledge, and wisdom to guide us going forward. Thank you. Let me hand back to Mings. Thank you. Thank you, Mings. Are you there? Yes, I am. I'm just making myself presenter. Thank you. Pat, will you please introduce our host for today? And you want me to do that, ma'am? Yes, please. Thank you. Our host for today is uh, Mr. Francis Masawi. Uh, sorry, let me just end this show you. I can't see the next part. Have you got, fr oh, there we are. Perfect, perfect. Let, let me also put my camera on. Sorry, I was hidden between amongst the screens. Uh, thank you, colleagues. And let me introduce our host for today, uh, Francis Masawi, a senior research associate with us at the University of Johannesburg. Uh, Francis and I worked together as we established the Southern African Power Pool. We launched it in, in 1995, following South Africa's successful readmittance to the international community in 1994. So thank you, Francis, and, the, and we've come a long way. Francis is an independent consultant, and he's got his qualifications from the University of Zimbabwe. And again, for the last few decades, he's worked with us widely across Eastern and Southern Africa. He's consulted widely for the World Bank, USA, the German government, the European Union. And again, as I said, a founding member of the Southern African Power Pool. So thank you, Francis. Your journey in terms of the Southern African Water Pool has commenced. Over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Um, 
ladies and gentlemen uh, uh we are now starting on uh, day one of the uh, of the uh, water security driven by industrial revolution 4.0 uh, virtual symposium uh day one is going to be talking about the uh, the establishment of the southern african water pool in an effort to try and address the 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 water security which is uh, in the in the in the facing us in the in in southern africa uh and and by extension facing the whole of africa uh, in fact so today's agenda we are going to go through with just said our opening uh, remarks uh, with a, a, a keynote address from professor pat naidu uh, we're going to have a presentation on the Southern African power pool, which is the, the, the basic, the, the bedrock of what we are trying to do. We, 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 we need to learn uh, lessons from there. And then we are going to talk to, to hear a presentation by uh, Dr. Sidney Gatta, uh, who is not with us today, because he's actually uh, uh, involved in a program to implement one of the programs, one of the hydropower projects on the Zambezi River, which forms part of his uh, uh, speech, which is the, uh, the Ten Gorges program project, which will be, which as, which will be presented by Professor Pat Naidu on behalf of uh, Dr. Gata. After that, we will hear of the tremendous opportunities in the in the in the DRC, which will be presented by Dr. Daniel Kubelwa. And then, after all the discussions about energy, because without without energy, we cannot not really move the water from where where it is to where where we want it. So we will have Engineer Munyaradzi Munodawafa who is the, um, the chief executive of the Zambezi River Authority to present the information about the operations of the water resource on the Zambezi River. And he's also going to touch about the Zambezi Water Commission and also maybe a possibility of including the, uh, the other river basins in Southern Africa. Then we have Professor Sarifa Abdelabaki, all the way from uh, Algeria at the university called the Pan-African University of Water and Energy Sciences, Paris, to tell us about what they are doing in Algeria, which I think part of it is a, a desert, how they are actually using water resources, uh, reusing water resources, for agricultural purposes. And then finally, we will have uh, Mr. Alex Bide, who's going to be talking to us about new ways of funding all these things, uh, uh, like what Professor Naidu um, uh, indicated, we now have to have a new way of thinking. The traditional approach has not worked. The traditional approach is actually not working in the energy sector, by the way. So we cannot use the energy sector, the, the approach in the energy sector in the water sector uh, going forward. So, uh, so uh, Alex is going to be talking to us about new ways of funding both energy and water infrastructure. Um, I would like there, there, therefore to call upon engineer Wilson Masango uh, to present to us uh on the southern african power pool uh, engineer masango is the chief engineer markets at the southern african power pool which is located in harare uh, you may also want to know that the while while the physical market trading is in harare the financial arrangements are in gaboroni botswana which makes the world trading of the southern african power pool quite quite sufficient, quite, quite secure. 
uh, he is re re responsible for the effective and efficient operations of the energy market in the Southern African Power Pool. He's got a Bachelor of Electrical and Electronic Engineering from the University of Swaziland and a Master's of Business Administration from the University of uh, Cape Town. Engineer Masango, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Bridges. Um, I will start my presentation. Please do confirm that you can see my presentation. Perfect. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Um, and a very good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Again, my name is Wilson Masango. I'm the chief engineer at uh, the Southern African Power Pool. Today, I'll be talking to you briefly about the SAPP in general. Um, and then because some of the uh, this will be my presentation outline and cut a bit on the operations of the SAPP in particular focus on the um, competitive markets and then discuss some of the challenges that you are facing as a power pole and also how SAP uh, could be used as a role model for this southern African water pool highlighting some of the points to consider while setting up this uh, power point. Um, the, uh, some of the key facts on the Southern African power pool, it covers 12 countries, the Sadak mainland countries, that is excluding the Oceanic states, and um, the uh, 12 countries uh, has a population of about 350 million people, and um, the installed capacity is currently sitting at about 69 gigawatts, but uh, the operating capacity is hovering around 44 gigawatts, which means we have a deficit at the moment when you consider that the peak demand is around uh, 50 gigawatts. The um, sub was actually created in uh, 1995 at the SADAC summit, so we are a SADAC baby. Uh, this was created by the mainland member governments who signed the uh, IGMOU, excluding uh, Mauritius, with the core objectives to optimize the use of available energy resources in the region and allow countries to assist one another during emergencies, also to cooperate and coordinate the planning and operation of the electrical power system, to facilitate energy trading, to promote regional cooperation and power projects, uh, risk generation and transmission, and also to increase access to um, electricity. The SAP exists to provide energy associated services in the region and beyond, and our vision is to be a fully integrated competitive energy market and a provider of sustainable energy solutions for the SADAC region and beyond. This, this both updated, recently updated mission and vision statements, and the focus now is to expand our services beyond the uh, uh, SADAC region, meaning we could even have membership beyond the uh, SADAC. Some of these SADAC governing, up, up governing documents in place, we've got the Intergovernmental Memorandum of Understanding, which I indicated was signed in 1995, but revised in 2006, this basically established the SAPP. We also have the Inter-Utility Memorandum of Understanding, which was um, which is signed by the sub-member utilities and it establishes the management of the power pool. We also have what we call the agreement between operating members. Uh, this one sets the requirements for operations of the interconnected power system and is signed by the interconnected operating members. And we also have the operating guidelines, which provides guidelines for operation of the system. And we also have market guidelines as well as uh, market book of rules, which um, govern the operations of the electricity trading. This provides rules of how to trade 
and how not to trade and uh, some of the settlement uh, rules, especially financial settlements. Um, we also have the coordination center constitution, which now governs the operations of the coordination center itself. The coordination center being the uh, facility um, that, is, that is actually uh, located in Harare. Uh, um, so the sub coordination center it uh, is responsible for the day to day running of the SAPP and also acts as the uh, market operator. Uh, this reports to the coordination center board, which is generally made up of uh, senior management from the uh, power utilities. And uh, we also have technical subcommittees, which are responsible for the different technical issues. Um, as we operate the uh, network as well as the markets, we have the planning subcommittee, the operating subcommittee, the environmental subcommittee, as well as the market subcommittee. I think the uh, titles they indicate exactly what these subcommittees are responsible for. Um, we all these uh, subcommittees as well as the coordination center board reports to the management committee, which is generally made up of uh, executive. Uh, members of the uh, power uh, utilities. And then we have the executive committee, which is uh, generally made up of um, a utility CEOs. This now provides, is the governing authority of the SAP and is also responsible among others for the admitting of new members. I'm getting a notification that I am experiencing some network connection difficulties. Uh, can I confirm that you can still hear me? Yes, we can, sir. Okay, thank you. Now, the um, sub-executive committee, then uh, for, for, for any matters that require um, SADAC approvals, um, we, as I indicated, that we are a SADAC baby. We are under the Directorate of Infrastructure at SADAC and issues that need to be discussed at the higher level within the SADAC structures then will go to the SADAC Committee of Senior Energy Officials as well as the um, Committee of Energy Ministers and it may be it will go to the Integrated Council of Ministers that is all the ministers and and if necessary again you know um, for all matters for example that need uh, legislative uh, changes then it will go all the way to the summit of the head of states of um, the, the SADAC uh, regional economic community. Um, in terms of membership, we've recently um, re reviewed our membership categories. Initially, we, we started off with just the power utilities, and then we allowed some other members, private sector participation from 2006, just to increase our membership. And now we've also even opened uh, uh, providing a new category called the market participant, which is meant for members whose main objective is to trade on the sub markets. This is for members who have a load or um, generation capacity of about five megawatts. We still have the national power utility member category, which is meant to recognize the members interested by the governments for sub ownership. Uh, we also have the operating member category, which is meant for members whose operations have a significant impact on the uh, subgrid. This is um, currently set at 300 megawatts of um, the generation capacity. In terms of the uh, membership, uh, we still have the 12 um, uh, power utilities and then under operating members, we've got, um, <coughs> excuse me, uh, five uh, members, uh, being CEC, a transmission company in Zambia, HCB, an IPP in Mozambique, LHPC, an IPP in Zambia, Matraco, a transmission company uh, covering Mozambique, uh, Swatini, as well as South Africa, and then we have Dollar Energy, which is an IPP in uh, um, Zambia, and our newest member is Greenco, um, under the market participant. We are currently processing quite a number of applications for, for this particular uh, membership category. In terms of the status of the electrical uh, connected power system, we have nine countries out of the 12 which are currently connected. 
um, the non-connected one being uh, Angola, Tanzania, as well as Malawi, but we already have a project, project in progress which would connect uh, Malawi to Mozambique, and we have um, projects being developed uh, to connect Angola to Nampawa and later to, to Snell, and then we also have another one uh, uh, in, in, in development to connect Tanzania to Zambia. We are hoping that uh, by around 2025, just about all the uh, member countries will be uh, interconnected. Um, I've mentioned that the uh, sub coordination center is the market operator and it is entrusted with uh, uh, the um, planning, development, and operation of the uh, regional electricity market. Just a brief on the um, uh, uh, um, regional electricity market. What is it? What is it? Basically, it's uh, actually a mechanism or a marketplace through which sellers and buyers of electricity interact to determine prices and volumes of power exchanges. It operates like a stock exchange, but for electricity, and sometimes we refer to it as a power exchange. Um, the prices are generally determined by the supply and demand balance at any given uh, moment. Um, the bids to buy and offers to sell are placed at the same, same time, and the centralized market clearing algorithm matches the bids and offers. The buyers uh, pay at most what they were ready to pay, and sellers receive at minimum what they were ready to sell for. It's the beauty of uh, this particular market. So when we run the market and there's a market cross, you cannot pay for what you didn't what we are not ready to pay as a buyer, and you cannot receive what you are not ready to receive as a seller. The uh, transmission networks enable the flow of electricity from lower price to the surprise area to higher price um, or the deficit areas. What is good is that um, the conditions and generation mix vary over time. So you may find that uh, in one hour, the uh, one country is exporting, and in the next hour, um, the, that same country is actually net importing. Yeah, in terms of the approach that you've taken as the, the SAPP to develop our markets, it's always been evolutionary rather than revolutionary. We all started with the bilateral contracts, um, which actually underpinned the development of the transmission infrastructure. And then we introduced the short term energy market in 2001, which was a very simple market where we were trying to share uh, any surpluses and make sure we try to cover to uh, make sure we all get a piece of uh, that available um, uh, capacity and then we had uh, a post term in 2002 which was some form of a balancing market and then in 2009 we had a breakthrough where we introduced the day ahead market and um, we had something called the post day ahead market in 2013 uh, but currently, in terms of the markets, we st we still have the DIA market, which was established in 2009. We introduced the forward physical markets, which is the month ahead as well as the uh, week ahead in 2016, um, and then the intraday ahead market in uh, um, intraday market in 2016 as well. We recently introduced the, a balancing market in 2000, in April 2022. Uh, but we still have the bilateral contracts which actually um, contribute the bulk of the power exchanges within uh, the SAPP. In future, we are considering under other markets, including the ancill ancillary services markets, uh, as well as the financial markets and some uh, green markets to also uh, take into account the um, renewable power that is uh, being developed around the uh, the region in the region. The markets are generally divided into two types. We've got one, what we call the auction markets, and two, the continuous markets. Um, the auction markets comprise of the forward physical market monthly, forward physical market weekly, as well as the day-ahead market. Um, the prices in this particular type of markets, which is the auction markets, is set at the interception between the seller's willingness to produce and the buyer's willingness to consume. 
So um, buyers and sellers uh, submit their bids and offers before a specific time, and all the bids and offers are cleared at the same time. The uh, market price algorithm determines the unconstrained system marginal price as well as the constraint uh, area marginal uh, system price. If there's a um, general, you will have one price set for all members or for all price areas. But if there are um, any constraints in the system uh, that is bottlenecks in the transmission lines, then the system does get split and you find that you've got one, uh, two or more uh, price areas. Um, in terms of the continuous markets, uh, which is made up of the intraday as well as the balancing market. Um, the difference between this one and the auction markets is that the moment is the willing buyer and willing seller, the trade is actually concluded, meaning um, it, it doesn't have to be one price set for, or for all um, participants. Um, and sometimes on this particular market, in fact, you are able to see any orders that you may hit, uh, that is to buy or to sell depending on um, availability of a transmission uh, path. Some uh, stats on the performance of the competitive markets uh, in the last financial year, uh, the total traded volumes was around 1,539 gigawatt hours with the day ahead market uh, contributing the most at uh, 77%. Uh, the intraday market at 11%. And then the forward physical market weekly, as well as the forward physical market monthly, uh, contributing the least at 6% uh, each. In terms of the market share, you can see that we started low. It's around, uh, in fact, it was much lower than this before. And at, uh, around 2014-15, we were still um, trading around 10% uh, of the power exchanges in the region through the competitive markets. And this rose to our highest in 2018-2019 of around 32%. But then we have seen some decline uh, to factors, including the drought that we experienced, as well as the COVID-19 um, pandemic over the last uh, two years. But we are seeing some improvement this financial year, where we are sitting at around 26% uh, currently. That is um, from April to August 2022. Moving forward in terms of some of the challenges that we are experiencing as a power pool, um, we, I mean, it is, it is known now everywhere, especially considering the load sharing that is happening uh, around the region, especially of late in South Africa. We have issues around generation capacity where utilities are actually struggling to meet the rising demand. Uh, mostly due to unavailability of um, um, generation uh, plants. Uh, we also seeing a uh, challenges in the transmission infrastructure um, where we still have the other uh, in countries which are not yet connected into the grid, uh, although I've indicated that there are actually plans in place to have them connected. Um, Malawi in 2024 and the rest of um, Namibia and Tanzania around 2025. We are also seeing a lot of congestion. Sometimes um, you find that there will be a match in, uh, uh, in the markets, uh, but the power could not be um, delivered or traded simply because there is congestion in the transmission uh, infrastructure. Um, and also, we note that they are uh, the corridors in the in the region in the transmission infrastructure. They are not suffi sufficient to provide for alternative um, flows. Um, the other challenge is on electricity market liquidity, where we see that some utilities still trade uh, um, pluses and deficits instead of um, considering the uh, markets in their uh, Merit step or the step. Um, we also seeing that the uh, tariffs currently are not cost reflective uh, in most member countries. So this also then affects the ability of these power utilities to actually buy power from the um, um, electricity markets, which generally is um, uh, cost reflective. Um, 
We've also seen issues around the system operations, at least the system performance, where we still have some planned and unplanned outages, uh, which leads to disruption in power flows. Uh, we are also seeing the low energy availability factors for most of the power plants. Um, another issue we are facing is vandalism, where there is actually an increased level of vandalism, especially over the last uh, two years or so, especially due to the um, um, economic uh, downturn as a result of the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Uh, the other issue is uh, resources, uh, limited resources where the generation resources as well as transmission infrastructure, special generation sources to provide ancillary services, uh, we, we are still seeing um, uh, some challenges there. The last point, certainly not least, I would want to discuss under challenges is the uh, regional coordination, both uh, political and economic. Um, sometimes um, the question is, is there political will? Uh, for from members to actually um, go with the regional coordinated approach in terms of development of the electricity supply industry. Um, you know, one question is, can I shelf my plans of, for example, a very most uh, of the of an expensive uh, power plant uh, and rely on my neighbor to actually construct a relatively uh, cheap um, uh, power plant? so that we can actually share uh, cheaper resources first before we can actually construct any other uh, most expensive one. And, and also the issue is, uh, especially economic, it would be some, some countries we find that they've got enough resources, but in terms of now the, uh, the financial muscle to actually develop those um, resources is actually a challenge. Um, an example would be maybe Great Inga, where there is a potential of around 39,000 megawatts even. Uh, but the question is, um, is there enough uh, financial support to actually have uh, such uh, developed? Um, this also could be a, a political issue. Um, now, how could this um, SAPP be used as a role model for the um, Southern African water? Uh, power pool, or rather pool. Um, some of the issues to consider when you um, when this uh, Southern African water pool is actually development developed will be the issue of cooperation versus competition. Um, cooperation is very is very important in this regard, um, especially as you start up. Uh, this includes the sharing of uh, data or information. Um, you know, most of the information, for example, in the power sector is considered to be very confidential, including the network uh, 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 diagrams for the um, uh, different countries. But when you go to the power pool, you need to be ready to, to share this information with uh, every member of the uh, pool. Um, you need to be able to identify each other's needs. Um, you should not uh, base your um, any flows uh, on just one-way flows, but uh, it should be more on sharing of resources as conditions change over time. I've mentioned earlier that uh, one country could be um, importing at one stage and uh, exporting in the next stage. So it shouldn't be about maybe one country or trying to exploit uh, other countries uh, who's we have uh, fewer resources, but more of cooperation. Um, this also includes the financing for the setting up of the power pool, of the water pool, sorry. Um, I'm used to the power pool. Um, of the water pool, um, this, this should actually be agreed on early on and um, the contributions to cover operational costs if necessary, especially in the beginning should actually be uh, agreed on. That is how the, um, the power pool is actually was established and that is how it's actually still run now in terms of the um, operational cost. The members still contribute even though the sub currently collects sort of, uh, you may argue enough to um, cover its operational costs. And also the issue of commission fees uh, should certainly not be a deterrent to trade, uh, but should actually support trading in the markets, just collect enough 
cover uh, whatever costs that are needed to develop the pool. And, and, and also, just to mention that there's no need to try and get everything right the first time, but uh, should be ready to improve as you grow. I've, I've taken you through the uh, evolutionary uh, development of the markets, um, which where we had some um, markets products uh, introduced, but later on discontinued as conditions uh, changed. Um, the other issue on the governance structure, um, we need to be certain on the ownership of the water pool. Uh, it is very important to set up the structure for decision making, but also it should include the technical teams, the one doing the work on the ground, and for all matters that require national policy reviews, there should always be a clear path to access the right authorities. I've shared with you the uh, structure of the SAPP in terms of how it links to the uh, SADAC uh, structure. Um, and the governing rules, governing rules, um, the um, the rules to establish the obligation from members needs to be in place uh, very early on, and members need to be committed to comply. You will recall that even uh, SADAC is not supranational at the moment, uh, so the commitment from members to actually comply is very um, important in this. And the local authorities should be able uh, and ready to recognize uh, such rules and hopefully enforce to the local uh, entities. In terms of regional um, coordination, um, the issue here is to try and ensure that national plans are not viewed in isolation, but uh, there is a need to turn national plans into regional plans. And uh, development of the infrastructure should be based on access to least cost or high benefit uh, projects first. Uh, uh, rather than just uh, developing the, the infrastructure um, without any any plan or coordination. The other one is on taking advantage of bilateral agreements. I want to believe there are already bilateral agreements in place in terms of management and sharing of water resources in the region, and this could easily serve as a benchmark for what is possible with co cooperation, and, and then access could easily be um, traded with other other members. And last but not least is on energy and water for sustainable uh, development. We all know how energy and water cannot be separated and by extension uh, food in this regard. And um, we do need to then cooperate together. Um, and the good thing is now we have advanced uh, systems in place that can actually detect even drought season. So the storage of water in this regard is very key. Uh, to try and manage uh, such changes in seasons. And water value should not just be related to generation of electricity, but also to uh, the management uh, of water for uh, consumption. That will be the end of my presentation. I uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Engineer Masango, uh, for um, uh, a very clear presentation on uh, why the SAPP was created. Uh, just to repeat uh, what you said, uh, the, first, the first point was it was created for members to pool resources and assist each other in times of emergencies. And we note that we are actually in emergencies. So something is not happening, uh, which was uh, thought of uh, in 1995 when the SAPP was created. But in terms of the, uh, uh, the role model for the creation of the Southern African water pool, I think you made it very clear that the, the um, the SAPP is a, is, is a SADC baby, and therefore it would also make sense to make the SAWP a SADC entity uh, following uh, along this, the same lines. But most importantly, uh, taking into account the issues of cooperation, uh, not, not competition, and, and also the fact that energy and water uh, are needed for sustainable development. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we will, we 
if you can uh, uh, note down your detailed questions after each presentation, at the end of all the presentations, we'll then have an opportunity for the panelists or the presenters who form a panel to address the issues, your questions, and also to address the theme of this, to say, can we really uh, create the Southern African water pool to address the water crisis that, that is before us? So I'll go to the next uh, presenter. The presentation is by Dr. Sidney Gatta, but it will be made by, on his behalf, by Professor Pat Naidu. Uh, over to you, Professor. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Chairman. There we are. Let me share that. Thank you, colleagues. I'll put my camera off now so we could use up the space for the presentation. There we are. Is that coming through, Mings? Are we happy? Perfect. Thank Chairman. you, Dr. Pat. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, colleagues, I'll share with you uh, uh, the thoughts of Dr. Gata in terms of developing further the, the hydro potential of the uh, Zambezi system that connects three countries, uh, Zambia, Zimbabwe, and Mozambique. And uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the project that Dr. Gata has, has put together, has conceptualized, the Ten Gorges project very much uh, building upon the Three Gorges concept back in on the Yangtze River in China. The points that you would like to talk about is in terms of the, the conception itself that started in, in the 1990s, uh, the opportunities to develop further and to find a way forward, again, embracing the SADC uh, community model of development. He's presented this program to the World Energy Council, it was extremely well received. And again, the World Energy Council, together with the Bretton Woods institutions of the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund, etc., are keen to see this project go forward uh, in terms of serving not just uh, uh, Southern Africa, but certainly continental Africa. The past, present and the future of the project will be, will be shared with you. And again, in terms of the challenges going forward, definitely driven by climate change. And again, how do we go forward and prepare, prepare the adaptation and mitigation technologies? Again, in terms of the, the, the financials, there's opportunity for us to, to build upon the workings in terms of carbon emission management. And this does all come out of the 1990 report. And again, um, he's shared with us that the opportunity uh, is viable and it can be taken forward in terms of bringing and realizing the project itself. The strategic options and targets for Southern Africa, again, the universal call for electricity or energy for all, the challenges of AAA, availability, affordability, accessibility, and then the opportunity to contribute to the Millennium and Sustainable Development Goals of the United Nations. Again, the, the resources uh, in terms of uh, that's available to assist in terms of reducing our dependence on, on fossil fuels is certainly hydro, available both on the Zambezi and again on the Congo River as opportunity for renewable energy development. We've got the markets as we've discussed, the, the SAP markets again are available. And then we've got the support from the various uh, institutions in terms of deepening regional integration. And again, the, the, the 10 Gorgeous project presents us with an opportunity as a case study and again, in terms of the Batoka Hydro Project Complex, it would be an investment that could be realized. So under the joint 
uh, umbrella of the Zambezi and Kafui Hydroelectric uh, uh, Authority, the project has been proposed. And again, this schematic lays out uh, the, the, the fall of water all the way from Zambia, Namibia, uh, all the way through uh, Zimbabwe onto Mozambique and then into the ocean itself, the Indian Ocean. Um, we've been on the Chobi River, the Zambezi River, extremely fragile environment. Uh, Mother Nature and all its glory and prosperity is resident in this area. But again, the water itself has been able to be tapped and harnessed for its economic potential. And I think working in with Mother Nature and the environment, we have an opportunity to bring forward this concept of the 10 Gorges project. And again, when we look at this diagram, this schematic, it brings very much home the picture of the, of the opportunity that, that Mother Nature gives us to harness the energy and the potential thereof for economic development and sharing of, of that of prosperity with the members of the region itself and certainly onto continental Africa. So, so it's certainly a viable project, and I think this is something that we need to, to seriously develop and bring forward, and um, both in terms of runoff river energy generation, in terms of energy banking, and also in terms of opportunities for energy storage. Right, I've, I've, shown, I've left that picture on a little while so that you could digest it. I think the, the, the Kariba scheme, the North-South scheme, there's 2,100 megawatts there. The Kafui Gorge has got another 990 megawatts. Uh, Kara, the, the Karabasa complex is just over 2,000 megawatts there, including the North Bank. Uh, the lower Kafui can give us another 750 megawatts. And you've got the, the Karabasa uh, North Bank, there's the North Bank comes in here, 1,200 megawatts. And then you've got the Mopandan Kua downstream from Kaurabasa of 1600 megawatts. So, so, so the potential exists. And I think we need to, to bring the hydrologists together, the engineers together, and help us realize this potential and bring it to market. And then the cherry on the top will be Botoka Gorge of 2400 megawatts. That, that, is, that is the biggest scheme that, that's at the top end of the, of the arrangement. And then there's the Boroma scheme at 450. So you could see how the 10 gorges is all now coming together and together with Dupata at the bottom end of 850 megawatts. Um, Devil's Gorge, 1240, and Mopata at 1200 megawatts. So certainly, certainly uh, capacity that, that is most valuable in terms of the Southern African context. So the potential, total potential of 10 gorges operating around 6,000 megawatts, new development of 4,000 megawatts, and future development of around 5,000 megawatts. So around a 15 gigawatt opportunity that can come to market. And again, this 15 gigawatts in, in the era of decommissioning of the thermal coal power stations in Southern Africa, as both South Africa and Botswana and Zimbabwe, uh, this, is, this is valuable, valuable green energy that can be put on the table. Uh, and we should explore this opportunity going forward. I see Dr. Gata has put his sticks on there. He's fairly confident that those ones are going to get going. Uh, Kaurabasa North Bank, Pandan Kua, and Botoka Gorge can go early and become the curtain raiser for the overall development itself. Um, sorry, these slides are repeating itself. All right. For the ten gorges to become uh, a reality, there's there's some some uh, opportunities that would need to be explored, and I think these are the opportunities that we need to work upon. Uh, we should have the various working groups dispatched from the Southern African Power Pool to to bring forward and to explore all the opportunities, environmentally, uh, technically, and uh, in terms of the engineering designs that will then go forward for project development and project investment. So the, the expected outcome is that of uh, renewable energy, green energy, that will then give us the opportunity for bankability. 
uh, both in terms of uh, the carbon credits together with the opportunity for uh, contracture. Um, the legal frameworks can be brought together and, uh, and this can then con conclude the project in a risk-free environment. I think that's it from or the some of the more pertinent stuff. Let me just bring them all on board. I see Dr. Gata's got all the fancy slides packed here. Let's just get them all together and then we can talk about it. Then he talks about the risk management thereof. And so he's, you could see he's given this much thought and he's packaged it collectively so that the project itself can be can be risk managed and delivered with confidence both for revenue risk currency risk the techno industrial capacity risk the hydrological risk and the enforcement risk in terms of contracts yeah and i think in terms of the 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 risk going forward i'm sure that the the teams would work on this and uh, and define each one of the the risk risk uh, challenges and the mitigations thereof. Uh, the hydrology of the Zambezi itself lends itself to to regularity in flow, but again, taking note of the 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 the, the boundary conditions of low rainfall and high rainfall. And again, this is all going to be subjected to the changing environment the changing environment due to climate change. And we're gonna find that we would need to carefully manage how this renewable energy resource is packaged and delivered. So the, the firm production is around, around the months of May to November. And again, the, the challenge will then be in terms of the hydrological performance thereof. He then talks a little bit about the commercial risk management and what happened in terms of, of the arrangements there. And the complexities associated, especially with, uh, with the currency um, exposure in terms of bringing this together. As Chairman mentioned earlier, with the Southern African Power Pool, we've always had this challenge in terms of how we manage the, the, the currency exposures therefore you would find that the the power pool itself headquartered in harare zimbabwe but we managed to get all the financial trans transactions going through gaboroni botswana so i think again we will manage uh, the 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 challenges on hand the present day challenges on hand uh, using the available markets uh, financial markets within the SADC region itself uh, botswana is certainly of world class standard and can stand up to the challenges as posed by the various risk issues regarding uh, payments and securitization. It talks a little bit about the the again the again the issues around the the currency, and again, as you see, note Zimbabwe is challenged with this issue around currency and and its dispatch. But again. The slides demonstrates that thought has been given to how we manage it and how we bring forward this issue of, of mitigation. Uh, I am quite confident that uh, we can work through these and, uh, and prepare the package so that the delivery would be uh, supported by the, the, the legal framework of, of individual countries and that of the SADC region. I'm pity that Dr. Gart is not here to, to explain uh, the details. I like his slides, he's got it well packaged, and that's the end of the presentation. But I think, colleagues, the, the important part here has been more uh, to share with you the concept of, of the 10 Gorges project, uh, the opportunity that's out there, and again, for us to develop that project, taking note that the environment that we would develop it is extremely fragile. All right, so thank you for that. And let me hand over to Chairman uh, for the next presentation. Thank you.
Thank you, uh, Prof. Pat Naidu, uh, uh, for uh, standing in for Dr. Gata. And as you say, uh, he would have been, uh, uh, I think, his presentation from his own mouth would have been, uh, uh, you know, we would have also had the opportunity to then, at the end of the presentations, uh, to to ask him uh, uh, detailed questions. But I think we will try uh, at the end, at the, at the end, to answer all the other questions. But I think the 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 the, the, the main point from this presentation uh, is the fact that. Uh, the intellectual capital to address any of the problems that we're facing in SADC exists in SADC. You may want to know that uh, the, uh, the Dr. Gata himself was uh, one of the founder members of the of the of the Southern African Power Pool, uh, carrying out clandestine discussions. Um, in Botswana, with uh, with uh, with uh, with ESCOM uh, 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 engineers, uh, executives, uh, during the time of the frontline states trying to reduce dependency on South Africa, so discussions took place between the frontline states engineering uh, executives with the ESCOM engineering executives to try and solve the problem that, 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 that was there at that time, which was the low hydrology, low water levels on the Kariba, on the Kariba complex uh, due to the drought of uh, 1991 thereabouts, where the water level had fallen to just about 0.5 meters above the uh, cutoff point for power generation. So the issue was then to try and, uh, and get to the uh, core resources uh, in South Africa, and and try and keep the lights uh, lights burning. So the intellectual capital exists in 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 in, in SADC. Uh, we must uh, take advantage of that intellectual capital to address this uh, water 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 security issue that is uh, before us. Uh, I will now go to the next presenter, Dr. Daniel Kubelwa. Um, uh, who is a postdoctoral researcher at the University of Sherbrooke in, in Canada. He has a PhD, electrical engineering and master's degree in mechanical engineering from the University of KwaZulu-Natal, uh, where he majored in uh, reliability designs of high voltage and ultra high voltage uh, uh, power systems. Uh, Daniel was behind the creation of the Energy Regulatory Agency of the DRC, which he based on the NESA model of South Africa, um, um, uh, which I think is quite a quite an achievement uh, to, to 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 do that. So over to you, uh, Dr. Kubelwa. Um, um, thank you very much, uh, everyone. Uh, for me, it's a, a, a great pleasure to be here and to share. I'm in Canada, it's, it's been cold. Uh, I've been here since um, uh, May this year. So it is uh, my first uh, summer, winter. So it's been cold for me, it's eating me badly. But I manage and here it's uh, five o'clock. I don't know if everybody can see my screen. I'll cut my my video. Can you see my screen? Dr. Kabalwa, just uh, swap your display settings as we discussed. Per perfect, thank you. And see, okay. Uh, I have been given the chance to present on the opportunity for hydro, solar, wind, and uh, natural gas power project in the DRC Congo. For me, it's a great pleasure, as I say. Uh, let me greet you. Uh, everyone good morning um as they present me my name is uh, daniel kubelo i'm from the drc congo i did my study in south africa i finished uh, 2020 then uh, i moved back to congo where i was lecturing at one of the university before they called me here in canada to help them with uh, some hydro quebec project and rt france 
Um, without uh, taking long, I'll start presenting on the opportunities on the opportunities we have in DRC Congo uh, regarding the, the 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 power. And as outlined, uh, besides all uh, all kinds of energy, God has blessed uh, the DRC Congo with many kinds of energy um, we we have a lot of water congo river we have the wind cap the capability uh, to produce the energy from the wind and we have uh, solar capability as well and uh, beside that we have non uh, renewable energy kind of uh, such as nu nuclear nuclear energy uh, we can sorry we can produce nuclear energy because we have a lot of uranium uh, which serve to end up the world war uh, world war one or two I mean and we have the the capacity of producing the biomass the electrical energy via biomass and we have the geothermal uh, energy power or capability as well. And uh, as for my presentation, I'll be presenting, uh, there is a lot of uh, work have been done recently by the World Bank and by NUTS regarding the development of uh, the energy sector. But I'll be presenting using the atlas, uh, atlas of uh, different capability of the DRC Congress to produce energy. And um, as I was saying in the beginning, that besides the the, the, the huge capacity we have of the, the Congo River, a lot of rivers, a lot of water, God has blessed us with many other kind of energy, which we can, if we want, can strengthen our capacity of producing electricity. But we we living now in the world where uh, climate change uh, got a huge importance because we need to leave something for the kid of our kid behind and uh, that's why our choice is whenever we want to take a decision in proceeding with which kind of energy to to develop we regard that as much important than anything else um, uh, then what is uh, the problem we have we know that uh, the Congo River has an estimate of uh, 100,000 megawatts and uh, the Inga itself got 89,000 megawatts. I heard one of my predecessors before Dr. Prof. Padnaidu, um, he, he touched about the Inga project, which I'll be touching as well. Uh, this behind the Inga project there is uh, not only the internal politics, but the most important things is the, the lobbying uh, against that project to be developed. That's what we see because recently the president at the London summit complained about that. He said, "There's everything is in place. We just need a developer to come on board, but they are dragging their feet. Um, I believe there is a, 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 a shadow hand behind everything. Uh, will stop Africa to go to move forward. That is my belief. As I was saying that Inga itself got 39, um, uh, capacity of 39,000 megawatts to be produced, which I'll be seeing. But uh, beside that, we have much resources which are not renewable as well, like uranium, like biogas, like biofuel we can produce. But what is the paradox is like, only 19% uh, of uh, our population got access to electricity, according to the World Bank in 2021. And uh, only, almost, as we can do the deduction, almost 81% of the population use woods and uh, gas for cooking. And those are, I guess, um, um, actually polluting uh, component they are using uh, against uh, uh, the climate change. So as you can see, the, there is the map uh, at your right. At your right, uh, there is a map. I'm trying to, I don't know, I'm trying to reduce this. Um, uh, 
the, 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 uh, there is a map and that map is um, is showing the access in the DRC Congo. It's true that the DRC Congo can, can play a big role in our African country with this amount of energy. We, we, we have the potentiality of this amount. We can play a huge role in Africa, like lighting all Africa. According to some study, they say third uh, quarter of the, 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 the African continent can be a light using the power produced by the DRC Congo. But it's a big paradox, as I was saying, if you see is only 9%, according, this is the, the PNUD map uh, 2013, they say we were only 9% of the population got access to electricity over 91%. Uh, uh, and if you see how the region are, in the Katanga region is almost uh, three to uh, seven to 30%. But if we, 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 we sum up villages, uh, it's going to be low uh, than 1%. And why in Katanga province there is uh, much than anywhere, anywhere else? Because these two regions, Sud Kivu and Katanga region, is where there is a lot of mining. And those mining uh, play a big role in re re to do the renovation of existing um, uh, power plants. And uh, uh, that's why you see there is a difference in Kinshasa uh, the, as, as well. Kinshasa is uh, the capital city. There is huge uh, uh, consumption of uh, energy. Um, and uh, as I will start with hydropower, and uh, talking with hydropower, if I don't touch about the Inca project, it's like, um, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm not thinking right, so I need to touch as well on the Inga uh, project. So if you see on my map on the left side of your, your left uh, part of your slide, you'll see, I don't know if you see very well, in blue, the triangle in blue, those are the sites already uh, uh, studied by um, our, we have a commission of energy in DRC Congo, which did the study of the potential uh, potential in, uh, hydro electric uh, project uh, to be developed. And if you see, there is a lot of them, is uh, uh, almost 800 sites, uh, which are gonna be developed with, we have in, investors on board. So in red, Scala is um, the existing, existing uh, hydropower station. Most of them uh, have been built uh, during colonization, so the uh, end of use they need uh, full rehabilitation. That is the sum of the problem we have. And in pink or magenta is, uh, as I was saying, those um, hydropower stations need to be rehabilitated. And as you see, uh, Congo River, the, there is every way we can do the we can develop our energy project using hydropower water. And at your right side, this is the um, Granga project planning, how they plan to do. In fact, from now, uh, Inga project, we got two uh, dam built, Inga 1 and Inga 2. But all the projects are going to go uh, till Inga 8. So, the biggest among all of them is going to be Inga 3. I, I mean, the next one will be Inga 3, but they'll be the biggest, which is going to produce 11,000 megawatts. And as you see, uh, they, they, they're going to go step by step. After Inga 3, they're going to go to Inga 4. After Inga 4, they're going to go and so on and so on. And after they finish everything, we will be able to uh, light third quarter of Africa and some part of Europe. And this huge project, as I was saying, everything is in place. When the president Kabila was in, in, as a president, um, he, he, he put together three companies because they were racing uh, to get the project. It asked them to come together in order to build this uh, uh, big project. And they agreed. So we have a Chinese and a Spanish company uh, which uh, a Spanish company, I think, was um, uh, 
uh, associate with uh, a Canadian company. So they sat together and they agreed to build up the project. And as well as uh, sometime one of the the, the shareholder or shareholder retrieve himself. I don't know what we 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 don't know what happened. And thirdly, uh, we have uh, this Australian company came on board. You want to take all the project, and we don't know what happened. They just went silent. So there is uh, actually, I think, a a, a politic to to stop this project to go on. Uh, we don't know what, but we believe that uh, everything's gonna be okay. Oh, and as I was saying, where is the DRC Congo standing in hydropower capacity or potential in the world? Um, is have been rated at 6%. We can, we, pro, we, we have the potentiality of 6% uh, in the world and against 87% in Africa. That 87% in Africa, it means like we can light, uh, we can power Africa, uh, third quarter of Africa. And uh, wh what is most important to know is, uh, as I was saying, uh, we it's only recently that the uh, energy sector have been uh, privatized. And when they privatized it, they want, um, uh, a lot of um, a lot of uh, independent power producer to come on board in order to to um, to improve the the, the performance of uh, of the power uh, distribution in, in in the country. But if you can see uh, up to now, it's only four percent of uh, uh, independent power producer. They produce only hundred megawatts. And uh, the 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 the, privatiz uh, 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 the the privatization of the energy sector have been effective since 2014. So, although there is huge uh, huge possibility opportunities of business, but uh, there is um, a very it's very very um, slow uh, the way uh, we see things. Uh, that's why you see and. Uh, in the right uh, right uh, side of my slides, uh, this is the current electric power capacity we have. Uh, we have uh, the different region. It's true that now we have a lot of provinces, but I, I consider the block of the big provinces before they subdivide it. You will see that uh, Bak Congo is number one, is because is where Inga is located. And we have a Katanga is because they all, there is mining project. And recently there is a Busanga project, which have been finalized, uh, which is a 2000, um, uh, uh, is a 260 megawatts have been finalized. And in total, only 2,500 uh, 2, uh, megawatts is uh, we are able to produce. But some of them is as um, uh, they present before, uh, Sometimes we, we have this instability, uh, which is due to our big long line, big forest, um, the, the high density, chironic density. In some points, we're going to light in some challenges we have. So as a wind, we, we have this atlas of our, our, us. Um, in Katanga region, you see that uh, there is a capacity of the wind is a four meter per second, which is the highest one. And we have in Kasari Oriental and uh, Bakongo as well is uh, two between two and two. And uh, we, we are able as well to that capacity we have of hydropower um, capability. We can add as well uh, um, the wind uh, in energy project. As well as the solar project, you see Katanga is uh, the highest one uh, below five. Uh, 0.5 kilowatt uh, meters uh, per day. So we have Maniema as well, and Equator come after that. The last one on the card is the uh, the Sud Kivu, which is uh, is uh, below uh, everyone. Uh, and the biomass, in terms of uh, uh, we we uh, the biomass, this at last have been developed based on which province is high in agriculture. 
uh, agriculture where there's a lo lot of farm and according to that they are can produce a lot of biomass which can be able to produce uh, seven uh, uh, giga uh, water per, per, per year then we if you see very well there is bandundu katanga as well the highest one we can have uh, an additional power as i was saying sometimes we avoid this kind of power because they come with pollution even if it's low but it's pollution we have a biogas as well which can uh, can play a big role in our in uh, improving our quality and our power utility and as well we have a geothermal in katanga and bakongo we have in uh, the red point here is where we have uh, boiling water so where they can produce a, a geothermal uh, power power and uh, you remember we got the uh, rift east rift is uh, um, where there is go mabukav where we got volcano there is a, a recent publication where um, a professor from the University of Johannesburg, uh, which demonstrated that in the volcano, we are able to produce energy. And by using that volcano energy is a way to, to, to make it dark. You won't gonna burn anymore. So it's opportunity they can use to, uh, in the rift African, where there is a lot of volcano and uh, at our right side, as I was saying, we we have uh, present, we have a lot of coal. Uh, we have coal, uranium, and methane gas. Coal we have in the Katanga region. We have some in uh, Manyema and Tanganyika. We have as well uranium in Katanga. And that uranium they used to finish the World War One. And we have actually the uh, methane gaze in uh, in uh, Lake Kivu uh, there is a, a, a in fact there is a in fact a, a, some company doing the exploration American company already started the exploration uh, beside that we we have uh, fuel uh, we have fuel in in in, in uh, uh, Kisangani we have a lot of fuel in the eastern region close to Equator, we have a lot of fuel as well, uh, Discover, which have been a big problem with the climate change because uh, some of the country opposed to, uh, to for us to use it, uh, they bring up the, the climate change uh, card. And as I was saying, we have some of the challenges which are very, very, we, we need to take account because most of the time, the politics uh, of our country, they don't take into account how the population grow. Like when you go in the Kinshasa, Kinshasa actually is the third um, country in terms of population. So when in Kinshasa, there is uh, like 15 million of uh, people there. And uh, we have a rate of 3% uh, per year. So uh, actually what they say in uh, 2015, our population gonna double. We 120 million, so we are gonna be 250 uh, million in 2015. So it's those parameters we need to take into account while we're doing the planning, planning of building new city, planning of uh, energy. We need energy for 250 million uh, people. Where are we gonna get the energy? So those are some of the challenges. A mining expansion. There is a lot of mining opportunity in DRC Congo, but most of them they don't develop because there is no power anymore. There's no enough power for them to do expansion. Now what they do, most of them they are using the, the, the thermic, they are using the diesel generators, uh, the gensets to to do small work. Another thing, DRC. Um, got a, a, a big equatorial forest, which is a big challenge in building a, a transmission line. When you build transmission line, we, we for, for instance, for stability reason, we need to have interconnection of um, a, a, a station, a hydropower station, gas station. We need to have, I mean, um, 
all the power producer we need to have interconnection in order to have this stability and allow us but because of the forest most of the time is impossible when you have a a, a hydropower station for instance in back congo to bring in kivu a long line it can be costly i know that in brazil they did that with long towers but uh, you know there is a, a lot of priority those are the some of issues Another issues we have, we the DRC Congo is located at a place where a region where there is a high keronic density, so there is a lot of strikes happening uh, over the year. So when they are doing the design of the the, the uh, power lines or hydro hydro uh, the structure, they need to take account to this keronic density, which will be um, a lot of expense, uh, another expense to be added to um, the natural expense and uh, other challenges we have some politics like we have we there is a lot of uh, there is lack of intensive research in energy field like what is the the plan of 2050 they're supposed to undertake huge and intensive research regarding those um, kind of issues because those issues concern all of us and uh, as as well as most of existing power facility in DRC Congo have been built uh, the time of colonized colonization, so they need full rehabilitation. As I was saying, a lot of mining company have been taking that um, work before they invest. They go and make a deal with Snell, with the government to say, okay, we're gonna take one um, uh, uh, hydropower station which have some turbine which are not working anymore we're gonna refurbish them and we're gonna use the power those are the deal they are making but those now because uh, those hydropower stations have been built for domestic use now because they made the deal with the company they will divert the energy toward the company those are some of the issues and uh, we have a overhead line cable theft and vandalism so because of load shading, what happened, the thief, uh, the, the thieves, I mean, they notice that there is no power. Then what they did, they, what they do, they come and cut the tower and make all collapse and retrieve the cable because we had some uh, copper cable on some of our tower. And the, with the, 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 the rate of the, the, the copper on the international market, they, uh, it went up and uh, they found a way to make some pocket money. So there is a lot of vandalism as, as well. And as, as well as I, 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 I underline something is lack of strong politics of promoting and attracting funders. There is no strong politics of attracting funders. You know, when investors want to come in our country, they want some security, some guarantee that their business gonna go forward. When the politic is instable, when people are, are not uh, taking uh, uh, with the word what they said, what is in the book, what, what is the right written by law, no one gonna come in the country. As well as a, a big, another big issue is the sovereign guarantee. So most of the African countries, they don't offer the sovereign guarantee guarantee and that sovereign guarantee is what uh, that guarantee the investors to know that if i spend my money i'll get my money back if uh, the company the state company doesn't return the the central bank gonna pay me back they want those kind of guarantee in order to come forward and some uh, suitable steps have been taken. The first one, as I was saying, uh, since 2014, June, uh, the, there is effective uh, private, uh, privatization of uh, the energy sector. And uh, the, 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 there is as well the authority of regulation of energy, which I, I put together um, um, as promised uh, those who are coming forward to invest a fair competition and as well as to protect us consumers. And uh, there is as well um, the promoting of, uh, uh, of, of uh, the, the, the developer 
of uh, production or generation, I mean, transmission distribution. So they want people to come forward of that and these door are opened in that way. And uh, we, as I was saying, uh, that the de de develop renewable energy can be a control weight to the, ex to the climate change. For instance, the expansion of the INGA project. Because if we have the INGA project, we want to go uh, developing other kind of energy. For instance, we, we can develop a, um, a nuclear energy because we have minerals to do so. But sometimes the, what's happening in Fukushima is something uh, which we cannot go because we uh, don't have capacity of doing the great maintenance. And those are the, 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 the thing for us. As there is an African proverb say this, the meat, the quantity of the meat of the elephant can't be eaten by one person. They need a lot of people to finish it. It's like the energy in DRC Congo. The energy in DRC Congo are so huge. We have a lot of potential uh, to develop. Uh, we have a lot of potential, uh, natural potential, Congo rivers, which if we put together energy, we put together um, um, connection, lobbying, we can develop our energy sector and we can be stable. And without energy, there is nothing can go, can move forward. Energy, um, electrical energy or electrical power is uh, the, the, the things we have to, the, energy, the kind of energy we need to, to have in order to be developed. And this is um, some of my conclusion. The conclusion is based on what the government has launched, uh, the energy sector, has launched the energy sector development program. Uh, they are doing the promotion of the program. So what they, they do is, for instance, when you go in private, so there is a, 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 a state agency who's gonna help you to facilitate getting the concession, getting the land if you go for solar projects. So as well as they are welcomes, they are welcome the developer of uh, power plants and generation as well as transmission. And uh, as I was saying, besides uh, the hydropower, we can the, the the government try to build the geothermal power plant uh, across the country. But beside the 71 sites we have already uh, re already uh, um, studied, so we can do that. And uh, as I was saying, there is a new hydropower station who have been finished and some are in construction, like Busanga project is a 250 megawatt, is a project I work when I was in a final year, uh, a, my final year project in uh, DRC Congo, have been finished uh, since last year, but they are doing the commissioning. And there is the Katende uh, 60, uh, that the Busanga project is the Katanga region. And uh, the Katende project is uh, in, uh, Kasai region, and the Sompwe is a project we started, um, but there is a huge problem because uh, the NGOs uh, brought up that you know, the, they develop it in a, a, a animal uh, reserve uh, park. Uh, that is the huge challenges, but uh, we know the politics uh, people are playing when they see is an African want to develop something like that. Uh, there is uh, a lot of things are coming behind. Um, as for my conclusion, um, this is an important, uh, important state company in the sector. There is ANAPI. ANAPI is all where all the investors are. Uh, is a state agency. We help investors to come forward, help them doing all the documentation and to make them understand what is going on or what they have to do. And as well as there is the authority of the regulation uh, of the, uh, the the energy sector, the electricity sector. Um, this authority have been promulgated in 2018, and we have uh, ANSA. ANSA is an agency uh, that uh, the job is to 
uh, electrify the uh, villages, rural areas, and we have our main power utility, the SNEL. This is an important uh, state uh, power utility. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Gubelwa. Um, I, uh, I, I, I wasn't aware that uh, the, the, the atomic weapon that, 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 that was used in the Second World War was from uh, DRC. Uh, but uh, I think if, 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 if we look at uh, uh, the presentation so far, um, uh from uh from the southern african power pool and from uh dr uh, prof naidus uh, on behalf of dr gata we there was a, a recommendation in 1990 that africans should not follow the developmental path for using energy that the developed world had taken was taking at that time uh but i think because we are always saying the funding is coming from the developed world therefore we don't do what we are supposed to be doing ourselves now with the 100000 megawatt potential just on the in the drc uh, or, or or just hydro potential what it means is that we can actually uh, replace the of course reduce not replace reduce the 60,000 or 50,000 uh, coal-fired power plants in, uh, in, in, in South Africa, isn't it? I mean, if you if you just looking at the numbers, the, 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 the energy transition to renewable energy is possible in Africa, only if the Africans do it themselves. Mm -hmm. You can't expect someone else to come from somewhere else to come and, <laughs> and solve your problem before they solve their own problems. You have to solve your on problems yourself. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Bello, for that. We'll go to the next presentation now, which is really on the water, uh, which is coming from uh, Engineer Munyaradzi Munodawafa, um, uh, who is the Chief Executive of the Zambezi River Authority. Uh, this The Zambezi River uh, struggles, uh, struggles 18 riparian countries uh, in SADC, which then means if there are 12 countries on the mainland SADC, it is quite easy to combine the, uh, the other river basins into, 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 into the, uh, into the uh, Zambezi uh, water basin. Um, engineer has got more than 36 years experience in the energy sector ranging from power engineering, fossil fuels, renewable energy, water resources, and large dam management. Uh, he is currently implementing the 300 million Kariba Dam rehabilitation project financed by, I think, the African Development Bank and pre-development studies on the 2,400 megawatts Batoka Gorge hydroelectric scheme, which is part of the 10 gorges uh, concept that Dr. Gata is, uh, is, is also working on. Uh, over to you, Engineer Nodawafa. Thank you. Um, I'm also sure in terms of my screen, is it showing now? Now we're waiting to view your screen, engineer. Is it showing? No, not yet. Oh. Let me resend the link to you. Just hold on a sec for me. Ah, oh, there we go. We're good. Please open your presentation for us, please. I, I can hear you, but uh, I'm not so sure what's happening. 
Okay, we see SAWP and conclusion. So please go to your first page. <laughs> okay, so which means I've, I've, I've concluded then. <laughs> yes, sir. But I, I think we would all love to hear your presentation. If you can please go to your title slide, page one. Um, I hope my webcam has been sorted out now. Okay. Uh, I was saying. Yes. Right. So good morning to you all. I hope everyone can hear me. Engineer Munadaf, your title slide is not showing. We see, still see your conclusion slide. Please go to page one of your presentation. I've, there we go. I've already done. I've already done. So maybe it's taking this time. Okay, there it's showing now. Thank you. Please proceed. Okay. So I hope it's not going to be delayed. Okay, fine. Um, my, my second slide, is it visible? Yes, it is. It is visible, uh, engineer. Okay, then. So that is my presentation outline. Um, obviously, the first point of call being that I would need to talk of the establishment of the Zambezi River Authority and uh, also to recognize the presentations that have been, um, uh, been um, presented. Um, and um, one of the anchors in terms of uh, Dr. Gata's presentation being the 10 gorges, which uh, we are as Ambez River Authority, it's a, it's a pinnacle or a pivot for our operations. And obviously also the linkages from the DRC as well as the other, the, the Southern African power pool um, um, experiences, which are we would want to applaud this team which has uh, come up with this uh, webinar to um, set the ground for the establishment of a, of a Southern African water pool. Um, so the Zambezi River Authority is a creature of um, a, an enactment of parliaments of uh, both parliaments of the Zimbabwe, the, 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 the republics of Zambia and Zimbabwe, and this was enacted on the 31st of October, 1987, and um, and it's a bilateral organisation owned by the two Southern African republics on a 50-50 basis, on an equitable basis. And uh, it's a, a successor a organization from the Central African Power Corporation that was ranging or running between the two Rhodesias in Yasaland. And um, so now when uh, Zimbabwe became independent, it was incumbent upon now the three countries to separate uh, the operations of a, a shared resource from the internal resources. And um, that's how it was agreed that uh, the Zambezi River Authority should now look after the shared resource between Zambia and Zimbabwe, meaning the Zambezi River. So, it was established to spearhead cooperation in the development and operation of water storage infrastructure along the section of the Zambezi River common to both countries. 
in this case, we are talking of the, the from uh, Kazungula uh, on the Zambian side to Luangwa, right at the entrance into Mozambique. And on the Zimbabwe side, also from Kazungula to Kanyemba. Luangwa and Kanyemba are just opposite each other and they are on the confluence of the Luangwa River and the Zambezi River, a very nice scenery which we have. So in between those, that's where the mandate for the Zambezi River Authority falls under. So it coordinates the bilateral arrangements between the two countries and with their neighboring states regards the progressive and sustainable utilization of the Zambezi River water and the associated environmental management programs. And this specifically for the uh, social economic uh, development empowerment and empowerment of the two republics, the region and Africa as a whole. Further, the Zambezi River Authority has also been mandated by the Zambian government to a large extent uh, look at the environmental social sustainability of the river from the source of the Zambezi River. We are talking of from the Kaleni Hills right up there in Zambia and the Congo as well as um, Angola. And then, uh, as you may be aware, the Zambezi River, the source is just a spring which goes, which now realizes itself in, uh, in Angola. And then it becomes a river in Angola, comes down out into Zambia at Chavuma. And then thereafter, I'll show you the, the diagram to that effect. So we have got gauging stations from all that area right up to, to the entrance into uh, the Kabora Basa or the tail end of the Kabora Basa on both sides of the two countries, Zambia and Zimbabwe. The governance structure for the Zambia River Authority is uh, it falls under a council of ministers and um, this council of ministers, this is, we are talking of the ministries of energy and finance, assisted by the two uh, attorney, attorneys general of the two countries. And this, they look on the overall policy and direction. And then there is a board of directors and the, the board members being permanent secretaries of the energy and the finance, um, finance um, ministries and two independent uh, board members. And then uh, the executive, the, the, the executive management with the uh, four departments, the water resources and environmental management, the projects and dam management services, then with the two support services, the, 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 the finance, as well as corporate services and board secretarial. Those are the, um, the, the positions. Now, as I've already explained, that is the map of the, um, of the purview in terms of what the Zambez River Authority, Authority deals with. And that is the catchment area and the detail in terms of the Zambezi River. You will notice that Zambia contributes 40.7% of the water into the Zambezi. Zimbabwe contributing 16%. And between the two, they have got more than half a contribution into the catchment or into the water supplies of the Zambezi. Yes, we have got Angola contributing 18.2%. Namibia, 1.2%, Botswana, 2.8%, Mozambique, 
eleven percent, and um, uh, Malawi seven point seven percent, Tanzania two percent. So maybe to correct um, um, engineer Masawi's uh, position in terms of the riparian communities for the Zambezi River, it's eight riparian uh, um, riparian uh, countries. So we are talking of Angola, we are talking of Namibia, we are talking of Zambia, Botswana, Zimbabwe, Malawi, and Mozambique. Those are the ones that formulate the riparian countries of the Zambezi River. Um, you may also at this juncture want to know that right now, these eight riparian um, um, countries have also um, um, agreed and they come up with what they call the, the, the Zambezi Water Course Commission. The Zambezi Water Course Commission, we can say the Zambezi River Authority is the midwife to that formation of that commission. In that from 1996, that was when SADC, when they started what they called the, the protocol on shared water courses, a, 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 prog a, a program was introduced, what they call the, 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 the Zambezi Action Plan Program. And one of the objectives was to form an overall commission that will look after the whole um, uh, the, 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 the Zambezi basin. So from 1996, we only managed to get the Zambezi Water Course Commission uh, approved by at least six countries in 2008 and its formation was uh, agreed to and that's when the ZAMCOM was formed. After it was formed, it was uh, Botswana uh, offered for, for the preliminary uh, or, or, or the, 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 the initial ZAMCOM uh, headquarters um, until a decision was to be made. And right now the headquarters is now in Zimbabwe. And it has got also an executive secretary. Um, so that is um, the, that is the, the catchment contribution in terms of the Zambezi Basin. So as you can see, the Zambezi River looks after looks after more of the Zambezi River than any other uh, utility within that basin. And uh, for the Zambezi River, we mainly look at, as I've said, the two countries, Zambia and Zimbabwe, and we do have what they call the upper catchment, that is uh, uh, from the source of the Zambezi right up to, um, right up to Kazungula, up to Victoria Falls, and then the lower catchment that comes from the Zimbabwe, um, from the Zimbabwe side, and the main contributors, especially on the upper side of the Kariba being the Gwai, and then uh, the Sanyati, and um, uh, and Ume. Those are the main rivers. Right now, uh, coming up with the aspects of the fourth industrial revolution and water security, just some aspects which we thought maybe people can look at is uh, what this uh, industrial revolution or industry four con uh, conceptualizes. And we are talking of the rapid change to technology, industries, and societal patterns and processes. And this straight away calls upon the need for increasing of interconnectivity and smart automation. So this uh, implies an increased need for water and sanitation for the global communities or rather the riparian communities. 
if we have that increased need, then it means we also need more investments in development of new water and sanitation um, infrastructure. However, suffice to note that uh, for us to develop a uh, water infrastructure, you cannot easily get financing. So we have to operate on the backdrop of a quick hit return on investment, which is energy or electricity. So that's why you find that the Zambezi River Authority, instead of falling under a water ministry, it falls under an energy ministry, an electricity or minister of energy rather than water. And obviously during formation, at those times, water and energy used to be in one ministry, but when they were halved, both in Zambia and Zimbabwe, separate, when they were separated, it became necessary that Zambia's River Authority falls still under the purview of the ministries with the energy portfolio. This is specifically because um, while the uh, water is needed, but to get financing, you can only do it through a uh, establishment of uh, electric power generation facilities. I thought maybe we would need to, on the onset, appreciate and understand that. Now, at the level, the regional infrastructure development master plan of 2012 to 2027, it calls for coordinated efforts in the industrialization process, calling on member states to pull their efforts. So already here we are talking of a political will to ensure that we pull our efforts. Just let's take note of that because this is one of the uh, angers in terms of coming up with the a water pool. People have to pull their office uh, efforts and that one can only be accelerated through formulation of a water pool. So for that to happen, it does uh, the process calls for increased availability of energy resources that would support the industrialization agenda. And across the Shadik region, Development of additional sources of energy is being accelerated by joint efforts of the member states, in many cases taking full advantage of the shared water resources cutting across states that can be impounded for power generation and other uses. Uh, and for, for us, in the Southern African um, quarter, uh, and it indicated there are those 10 gorges that now uh, we do for a powered a uh, high infra uh, link uh, the infrastructure will not do in a southern art energy resources, specifically electricity. Then, regardless of the fact, regardless of the fact of uh, climate change variability scenarios. Also, the linkages which we need to look at again, obviously, is the SDGs, in particular, number 17, that interlinked goals saving as shared blueprint for driving peace and prosperity of mankind uh, and planet on the planet. Then the SDG number six, to ensure that ensures availability and sustainable management of water and sanitation for all. So that one is pivotal for us as a reserve authority in that there is need for sustainable harnessing and managing management of the water resources. And uh, that uh, links that uh, uh, SDG to the river basin contributions. 
We are obviously aware that the water resource remains a scarce resource that cuts across boundaries in river basins. Therefore, joint and coordinated efforts are key in ensuring its sustainable management as well as achieving water security. So on the onset, what really means, what this means in terms of the joint and coordinated efforts is to take the advantage of the synergies which we have and also the linkages which we have. For instance, we 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 had a presentation on the on the on the Democratic Republic of Congo in terms of the um, the Congo River, the Inga development. But when you look at the Congo River, when it supplies, when after it is after all the water has been used and it's on its way to the Pacific Atlantic, that water causes also havoc as it goes. So the position is if there could be a linkage where part of that water, a canal is built from the Congo River going into the Zambezi, it's possible. And feasibility studies, or rather pre-feasibility studies have been done. And they actually, the, uh, the, the, an Israeli company did put in a presentation to study sometime back in 2000 and, uh, 2008, where they indicated the possibility of that happening, irregardless of the fact that there are a lot of, uh, uh, the, a lot needs to be done, but it's a possibility. And that way, we can now control the water that goes uh, to waste, or rather goes and, and causes havoc as it goes. So that's number one. So that linkage needs to be considered. And then in the north, uh, on the northern part of Zambia, we've got what they call the, the Luapula Basin, which currently, actually the, the, Zamb the Zambian government is currently at an advanced stage in uh, formulating that basin. There is also a possibility that that basin could be linked to the Zambezi. So should those linkages be coordinated and uh, effected, it now means we can even beat the climate change issue. I have not uh, put this down um, because some of the information I'm presenting obviously would require a, 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 maybe a bit of some permission from, from the other concerned parties. So I would have hoped maybe they would be present to make the presentations, but be that as it may, what I have informed is the fact that is being considered at very high levels in the, in the Sardic region. Then another issue in terms of uh, the water security is the declaration on the water storage that was done at the International Commission on Large Dams. And that was done in 2012, where it was noted that there is now increased water scarcity and the only solution is water harvesting. That is additional water storage infrastructure needs to be developed and this can only be done through joint efforts. And uh, it was uh, noted that come 2050, the availability of clean water, fresh water, worldwide is going to be a problem. And for us to ensure that we have adequate supplies of water, the, we, the water harvesting um, possibility is the only way. And no wonder what has been presented in terms of uh, the 10 gorges is a quick hit solution to that impending disaster, which is going to befall, to befall us come 2050. 
And uh, just on the sideline, it was noted that uh, by 2025, South Africa would be the first one to face the issue of, uh, of water, water scarcity, clean and fresh water scarcity. And uh, in terms of that, there is also need for an interconnector from the Zabez River going right into the South African Botswana systems. And um, it is also, we just want also to indicate that uh, the first phase of that is already started by the the Gwai Changani Dam that the Zimbabwean government is building. And uh, it has got full support from the Zambezi River Authority in that it has got a far-reaching um, a far-reaching outcome. In that, once that pipeline is built right up to Bulawayo, then there could be a linkage between uh, Bulawayo and Francistown through the Shashi River. And you know where the Shashi River goes, that linkage could get us right up to, to Lincoln, the, the, the Limpopo uh, Basin, a commission which is in in operation right now and again already with that linkage we can already talk of a southern water pool southern african water pool and those linkages are real and realistic as river basins and associated water resources cut across boundaries and regions joint development and management of new water storage infrastructures underpins underpins Uh, underpins the efforts in the river basins for achieving sustainable water resources management and water security. And uh, what I have uh, indicated, obviously, is something which uh, makes a lot of uh, sense. So, just uh, to inform, uh, in terms of what I've been talking about, now, when we zero in on the Zambez River Authority water security plans along the Zambez River, we are talking of establishment of upstream reservoirs which allow upstream utilization of river waters for various industrial economic activities, first and foremost power generation, then irrigation, while seasonally scaling down on generation at downstream dams, especially those with larger water storage, storage reservoirs. We are talking here of the conjunctive operation of, uh, of, of those uh, for dam synchronization for, for lack of a better word. So for the Zambez River, existing water storage potential sites present such an opportunity to sustainably harness the waters of the Zambezi. Anchoring the efficient utilization of water and a cascade system of dams that will be established and the large storage capacity of the um, existing Kariba dam. Um, so you can see how this, uh, the presentation we got in terms of those gorges can be realized. Um, so the authority has proposed and uh, adopted the approach of conjunctive operation as part of a climate resilience adaptation strategy in underpinning water security. So that's why first and foremost, the proposal that the authority is making is building upstream of the Victoria Falls, a reservoir, 20 kilometers, uh, um, 20 kilometers upstream of the Victoria Falls, there's what we call the Katombora area, 
we are proposing that the reservoir should be put there. That is the first port of call. And then that one will now provide controlled flows and as and when the climate uh, variability opportunities provide. Then we have got obviously the Batoka Gorge, the Devil's Gorge going down, and then Mpata Gorge going down, Mozambique, the Boroma, and Mpandangua, uh, and, and, and it goes on. So, owing to the nature of the potential themselves on the Zambez River, suffice to say that the transboundary cooperation remains key in this undertaking development, uh, this uh, undertaking of the development of, of, of water storage infrastructure. That's a familiar site which you can see. And um, in as far as the Zambez River Authority, we are already, um, um, maybe just to inform you that uh, part of one of the legislative uh, mandates given to the Zambez River Authority is that development. And this is done in conjunctive with the electricity undertakings. And we are talking here of Zesco Limited as well as um, Zesa Holdings. So in agreements with these two utilities and in agreements with the respective uh, plans for the two countries, obviously the Batoka Gorge had been cleared and has been cleared for development. I will talk a little bit more with that. So I don't want to go further on this because it has been looked at in terms of uh, that has been talked about in terms of those 10 gorges. But the only thing I wanted us to appreciate on that one that has been left out is the, the Katombora Reservoir, which once it's, it has been put, it provides opportunity even for Botswana to be able to abstract water without, a, without, any, without any, any, any problem at all because there will be a reservoir that can plant and I mean that can provide the water as needed. Now, one of the major issues the Zambezi River Authority obviously has to do is to maintain the existing facilities to make sure that there's water security. And with that one is the Kariba Dam has already been uh, indicated we are currently carrying out the Kariba Dam Rehabilitation Project. That is a $300 million project uh, funded by uh, what we now call cooperating partners. And this is a combination of the African Development, African Development Bank financing, the World Bank, as well as the European Union, and individual countries like Sweden, the Swedish government. So we are carrying out that rehabilitation program to ensure that the dam is, is sustainable in terms of uh, it's safe and reliable. And this has to be done by reshaping the plunge pool and uh, so that we can prevent preferential erosion that occurs along a fault zone that has been that has been discovered uh, on the weak rock formation that is aligned towards the foundations of the dam and then obviously also some spillway refurbishment that is the spillway that is the flood control um, facilities where we need to replace secondary concrete and steel guides um, and this, uh, the need being um, because of the effects of an alkali aggregate reaction, which led to distortions of steel guides, which led also to difficulties in operations of steel, of, of, of steel, of stop beams. So those are just the features in terms of the plunge pool. Uh, you will notice there, uh, when we opened the floodgates, the water was coming to the pool. 
under normal circumstances, there was supposed to be a natural pool uh, where the water was falling through. But then because of a faulty, a rock, faulty rock formation, this natural pool could not be formed. And so the preferential erosion was now going towards the foundation. So that is why we were worried and we have decided that we have to now um, do a reshaping of this pool so that energy dissipation in the pool can now be carried out and the water goes downstream rather than going, the, the, the force is going towards the foundation of the dam. So that is the basics, the basic uh, need in terms of the reshaping of the plant pool. So that is the profiling which we are going to do and the work is at an advanced stage. So for us to do the, the work in the pool, it has to be done in the dry. So we have already constructed the cover dam there and we are now dewatering, that is removing water from the pool. And we are using a method like when you do, uh, the method we are using there is um, uh, open cast, the, the, the method that is used uh, when, you, when there is open cast mining. So it will be a stepped removal of rock formation until a pool has been made. So that work is going on and we expect completion by 2023, latest 2024. And we are also doing the work on the spillway. You can see that is exactly what is on site. And we are looking at completion of those spillway. There are six spillway gates, which we are going to refurbish and make sure that their operation in terms of flood control, release of water floods when there is need. Then uh, coming to the Zambezi, the Batoka Gorge Hydroelectric Scheme, we, as I had indicated, a clearance to develop the Batoka Gorge Hydroelectric Scheme was given in the 2012. It was agreed to by the two governments of Zambia and Zimbabwe. And immediately after that, the World Bank provided um, a funding for the feasibility studies, a $6 million fund through the International SIWA Grant Cooperation in International Waters for Africa. So we got the $6 million grant and appointed the EY for the as, 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 as our um, transaction and um, the transaction advisors. So uh, we have now since done and completed the engineering feasibility studies. And uh, we are on the verge of completion of the SCR studies. And actually the report is now undergoing environmental regulatory review and the clearance. The intention is the implementation has to be done on the pri private public partnership. Obviously, you may be aware that there was an attempt to get a developer, and this was done on the premise of the promise that was made by the, the Chinese government in 2018 at uh, FOCAC, that is the um, a forum. For, for, for African states with China, where if you may recall, the Chinese government promised to provide 71 billion US dollars for the development of renewable energy projects for Africa. In particular, they promised the development of the Batoka Gorge. So, based on that promise, a developer had been. Uh, on a selective tendering process, a developer, a Chinese developer um, with a consortium of a Chinese developer and an American uh, was requested to, uh, to start the processes. However, um, due to the economic positions and conditions of the two countries, the program had to be stalled a bit in terms of uh, funding, given that the two countries could not provide the bank guarantees that are needed. 
So once we are done in terms of the uh, uh, feasibility studies, we are now looking at how the project can be bankable and also the risks, the, the hydrology risk, which uh, a lot uh, of uh, people have taken interest in. Um, needless, obviously, to say, the development of uh, the Batoka Bodge Hydroelectric Scheme is still on course and, uh, and that the two governments are keen to see it completed. So we are working to make sure that uh, this is done. Those are some of the layout. And uh, one of the issues which, which, which really also strengthens the need for the Batoka Gorge Hydroelectric Scheme is also the strengthening of the central uh, transmission corridor for power. Where from Batoka, there's going to be a line, a 500 uh, kV line from Batoka to Chakari, right into the center of the Zimbabwe transmission system. That alone is going to strengthen this uh, system and give a lot of leeway in terms of uh, movement of power, even through the Southern African power pool. So that is one of the advantages this project is going to give amongst and uh, most important ones of uh, the economic empowerment for the two countries, as well as the region. Yes, one of the issues for the, which is a challenge for the Batoka scheme is the, the power offtake. Um, uh, the Southern African Power Pool presentation talked of uh, the unsustainability of the tariff tariffing systems, whereby some of the utilities um, charge um, non-economic reflective tariffs, and because of that, they find themselves are uh, not uh, in a good economic position. So, for them to be considered by banks as of takers, it causes a lot of uh, issues. So that is one of the issues which the authority together with the two utilities are working on to see how uh, the offtake issue of the Batoka scheme can be carried out. But uh, obviously, if we look at the synergies required, this uh, issue can be resolved. Then uh, further to that, the Zambezi River Authority is also involved in the pre-development um, activities for the Devil's Gorge. Expressions of interest have already been advertised for pre-feasibility studies, and the studies are scheduled to start this coming year, if not in the coming two weeks. And obviously, we are also looking at the climate resilience and conjunctive operation considerations with Kariba and Batoka factored into the terms of reference for this uh, study. Can, can you please, uh, can you please rep, rep up? So to, uh, to conclude, we are looking at, uh, when we look at this um, Southern African water power pool, there are certain factors that need to be looked into. The cooperation. There is need for deliberate, coordinated, and joint efforts in the planning implementation by the, all the riparian states. Then there is also need for conducive legislation obviously based on the SADC protocol on shared water courses, this opens up for the interconnections I was talking about for the commissions. We are talking of the Zampom, we are talking of uh, the, 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 the Luapula, we are talking of the Lake Tanganyika, we are talking of the, um, the Botswana, Okavambo, we are talking of uh, Lincoln, the the Limpopo, as well as all the other commissions that are in South Africa, Botswana, and, the, and, the, and the Namibia. 
Then the governance part of issues, the water energy nexus, we are talking of the water utilities joint operations coming in together. We are also talking of that conducive or the governance in terms of the line ministries to be involved. Well, we've got energy there, we've got finance ministry and also water ministries, maybe even environmental, green economy and all that. And then the other issue obviously is the financing and the bankability of the issue, which has to be underpinned by the development of uh, um, corresponding power generating facilities. And all this um, being underpinned by the political will of the of the Sadiq community. Uh, community. Um, so provision of financing for the development of the large water storage infrastructure remains a challenge in sustainable water resources management and water security. I want to thank you. And obviously, uh, even in all the forums, uh, the Zambezi River Authority is uh, given. We are always the last in making our presentations. So, uh, we get cut off before we really put in an issue. But be that as it may, I wish to thank you very much for your attention and uh, we can discuss further. Thank you. Thank you, engineer. Uh, I, I had to restrain myself to make sure that you, 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 you finished and you did, you did very well. Um, and you are not the last uh, speaker. Uh, the, 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 I think the issues are of very great interest uh, with respect to uh, the topic that, that, that we are discussing. And I think to our uh, uh, South African attendees, I think uh, it is quite, quite an interesting to, to note that there are already steps to address the water crisis issue that, that, that was, is focused for 2025 with the uh, water projects from the Zambezi River and I think one of the other projects which is physically under, under, under construction right now is a, a water pipeline from the Limpopo River to, to feed to supply water to the to, to Polokwane uh, being undertaken by the former Salini uh, construction. Um, thank you very much, engineer. Uh, the next speaker is Professor Sharifa Abdelabaki, uh, who is the water coordinator at Powers in Algeria. She obtained her PhD degree in 2014 and is a senior lecturer in water sciences at the Department of Hydraulics, Faculty of Technology. Uh, she's heading the research team, Water Resources and Mobilization at the University of Clemson in Algeria. She's the water program coordinator at the Pan-African Institute for Water and Energy, including climate change. So uh, we, would be honored to hear your presentation, uh, Prof, uh, on your experiences in water ut utilization for agriculture. Over to you, Professor. Yes, thank you so much. Uh, is it okay? Perfect. Thank you, ma'am. Yes. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for giving me uh, the opportunity to present. Uh, yes, I'm turning my camera off in order to have like an uh, enough uh, connection. Uh, thank you so much for giving me the opportunity uh, to present uh, uh, our experience. Uh, thank you so much for the organizer for this very interesting uh, online symposium. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm Sherif Abdelbaqi. I'm from, uh, from uh, Pan-African University Institute for Water and Energy Sciences, uh, including climate change. I'm the water uh, program coordinator. I will present 
uh, like uh, a thematic related to the water use for agriculture proposes the Algerian experience. This presentation uh, uh, was uh, in collaboration with my colleague Rashid Yahyawi from the National Office of Irrigation and Drainage Algeria. The outline of my presentation as given as uh, yes. Uh, part of the presentation, uh, quickly, I'll do it. Then water use, uh, technical uh, aspect and main experience, water use law, uh, and, uh, and some uh, point related. Just one minute, please. Law and the standards, and then uh, reuse ongoing project in, in Algeria. Let's start by presenting the Pan-African University. Uh, it is the flag, uh, flagship program of the uh, African Union, uh, and it is a Pan-African internationally and network university that was launched by the head of states to contribute to the development of higher education and applied research in order to ensure the sustainable uh, socio-economic socio advancement in, in Africa. Uh, the PAL, the Pan African University, uh, is a response to the need to revitalize the higher education and research as major tools for ensuring high level for intellectual capital for Africa uh, development and to promote world class and yet locally relevant research uh, to provide uh, an exemplar of uh, for excellence in African higher education and and the research and to 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 give and to produce uh, a productive partnerships with the public and private and private sector this is the map of the of the different institute of the power uh, powers is located in algeria uh, especially in the north part in clemson uh, i give you just like uh, uh, a brief idea on powers. The Africa we want, an integrated, uh, uh, peaceful uh, Africa, driven by its own citizen and representing a dynamic force in the international arena. Uh, the objectives, uh, the vision and mission of powers at the level of the continent is to, to promote an exemplar uh, for excellence in Africa, uh, higher education and research facilitating the, uh, the networking and the mobility, uh, giving like a dynamic and a productive part partnership with the public and private sector, and uh, to give like a new way to the research and higher education as major tools for ensuring intellectual capital for, for Africa development. Uh, Powers is offering uh, three program of MSc: uh, Energy with with the two tracks, Energy uh, Engineering and Policy; Water with two tracks, uh, Engineering and Policy; and the new program of Climate Change, uh, also with with the two tracks, Engineering and, and Policy. This is some uh, statistics uh, statistics about uh, about. Uh, the student at Paris, the, na the nationality, the, the gender balance, etc. It's just to have an idea. The Paus research, research agenda to the powers is related uh, especially on water, uh, energy, and climate change that, uh, uh, under uh, several, uh, several uh, uh, titles. The main research projects at Paus are given here. And we have actually uh, some ongoing projects related to the to the uh, energy part. Uh, for example, the Libri project. We have also uh, a project related to the transforming energy access. And then the African School of Regulation uh, initiative. There is uh, some uh, partnership with uh, uh, the ERD, the Institute of Research and Development in France, and. Uh, we are uh, we are also uh, working uh, in the program core to core with a Japanese university. Our main partner are given are given in this in this slide. Yes, uh, 
For, for, the, for the main uh, part of the presentation, uh, which is related to the water use for agricultural purposes, I will sh share with you some, uh, some uh, technical details and some, uh, some also institutional details about our experience, our, our experience in the field of the water use, uh, water use for agricultural purposes. You can see that water availability dropped uh, to under uh, 447 uh, cubic meters per, per capita per year uh, uh, in Algeria, which is uh, significantly below the scarcity uh, showed for 1,000 cubic meters per, per, uh, per capita per year set by the United Nations Development Program. Yes, during the, uh, the last uh, 25 years, Algeria has experienced a severe uh, drought, which has affected the country rainfall by causing important deficit in the wall of the country. The, pluvi the pluviometric deficit has been evaluated uh, to nearly 30%. Models of climate change indicate that rainfall could decrease by more than 20% by the coming. Uh, uh, 20 or 30, uh, 30 years, which would result in a greater uh, worsening water shortage in different basin of Algeria, especially in the west part. Agricultural irrigation is the primary water consuming sector, followed by the domestic and industrial sectors. Agriculture is facing actually more and more serious problem in irrigation. Water intended for this purpose is almost ready, and the application of adequate solution is essential to adapt to climate change. Related to the uh, APCC, it defined climate change adaptation as an adjustment in natural or human systems in response to actual or expected climate stimuli or their effect, which moderates harm or exploit beneficial opportunities. In this regard, we took like, yes, this is the most important point related to the water scarcity in Algeria. There is increasing population growth, over exploitation of fresh water resources, surface and groundwater pollution, and the climate change. For this reason, without that, the water reuse will be for us a new adaptation measure to, to the climate change. Because, because of water reuse, it's like an alternative water supply uh, uh, solution. It is also a food security tool. It helped to reduce environmental impact of, this, of uh, discharging and treated uh, wastewater. It is also a climate change adaptation measure, and it is, it is part of the integrated water resource, resource management. Uh, let's give you like uh, an overview related to the water resources in Algeria. We have like um, uh, conventional resources for the renewable resources uh, it is just an, estimate, an estimation, 14.4 uh, billion cubic meter per year. For the underground resources, it is 3 billion of cubic meter. For the surface water resources, uh, 11.4 uh, billion cubic meter. And for the inconversional resources, we have a dissemination with uh, 1 billion cubic meter and the treated wastewater with uh, uh, 400,000 cubic, cubic meter. Related to the uh, National Office of Sanitation, uh, this office is managing 154 wastewater treatment plants. Uh, for, uh, for this 154, there is 75 lagoons and 70, 76 activated sludge wastewater treatment, treatment plants with the nominal flow that exceed 1 million uh, cubic meter per day. The process used are activated sludge and natural lagoons. We have just 70 wastewater, uh, wastewater treatment plant that uh, are taken in, in, in the project of, of reuse. 
for, for the treated wastewater in agriculture with a rate with just 6%. Uh, the, the volume reused at the end of August uh, 2022 is uh, uh, 14.6 million cubic meters to, ir to irrigate more than uh, 11,000 uh, uh, hectares. The volume of treated wastewater uh, exceeds 20, 20 million cubic meters uh, with an average daily flow of, uh, or it, it is more than uh, 600,000 uh, cubic meters per, per day. The potential of this resource in Algeria is estimated between 700 and 750 million, million cubic meters and will, re, uh, will reach to uh, the volume of 1.5 billion uh, cubic meter in uh, 2040. Just to give you like a potential of water reuse for agricultural purposes in Algeria, uh, there is uh, actually uh, 17 projects, and this is the project uh, the projection for uh, for uh, 2024 and 2030. Uh, this data were, were, were shared by the, uh, the National Office of Irrigation and, and Drainage. The main project, or some experience in Algeria, the main one and the old one uh, is the experience of, of Clemson. Of, uh, it is just a 10 year uh, project. It is the irrigation of the Henaya perimeter. Uh, uh, over uh, 912 hectares, which has been in operation since uh, 2012 and supplied from the, the wastewater treatment plant from Ailhout in Clemson. There is also the irrigation of the Mleta perimeter uh, with, uh, with, a, uh, with a surface of six, more than 6,000 hectares. Uh, this perimeter is supplied from the Kerma wastewater treatment plant and the experience of, of the, the reuse is, is very young. It is just four years, four years as the age of the project. This is the two main project actually, but there is other, like for example, the irrigation of the perimeter of Temasin, the irrigation of the perimeter of, uh, of Borbo, Borali Ridge, the irrigation of the perimeter of Setif, the irrigation also of the perimeter of Hamabuziyan, uh, mass, uh, the irrigation of the perimeter of Mascara uh, from the wastewater treatment plant uh, of Mascara and for some lagoons at Addis Ababa, with, with actually uh, a surface of uh, uh, twelve uh, thousand hectare. This is some some pictures uh, from uh, the, office, uh, the, the National Office of uh, Irrigation and Drainage from the main project of, of the water reuse for agriculture uh, purposes. Are you hearing, please? Yes, we can, we can, we can see. Thank yes, thank you. Uh, we have four for the for the main uh, for the the first and the main project. It is the project of the of the Henaya. Uh, there is a uh, twenty twenty eight collective and individual farms, and uh, uh, the the most of uh, plant are uh, citrus fruit, olive olive trees, and various uh, fruit trees. The irrigation method uh, practiced are gravity mode with the conversation to drip since. Uh, 2013. There is also irrigation uh, of the perimeter using uh, purified water. Uh, uh, I mentioned that it began in uh, 2012. The perimeter uh, saw an increase in irrigated area, uh, three, uh, 360 hectare in in the just in the beginning of the project, and actually uh, it is that more than uh, 800 uh, hectares. Yes, we can see like the evolution of the irrigated area using uh, treated wastewater. The, uh, I said that the main project are the project of the Karma 
and the project of Ayn uh, Hud and this table uh, give us like an idea about the evolution of the irrigated area uh, during the, the, the four uh, last years. Yes, just just uh, the pre pre preliminary result related to the crop yield in both perimeters, Hinaya and Mleta. Uh, just to give you uh, an idea, these 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 perimeters are uh, in the west part of Algeria, and and it is the part that it is uh, uh, less. Uh, we have a very a very. Uh, a, a, a serious problem related to the scarcity. Yes, the for, for the serious categories of the plant, we have like the increasing of, of the yield before before the, the reuse and and after using uh, the wastewater treatment plant uh, treated, uh, treated uh, water for, for irrigation. Yes, it is like in this slide the the irrigation method used uh, between 217 and uh, and 200 uh, between 20 2017 and 20 sorry 20 uh, 21 just uh, to compare the, the several method used uh, for for the irrigation related to the water quality also uh, I I'll give like an example related to the to the data given in the uh, in the input of the of the wastewater treatment plant and and the output and we can see that uh, that the performance of of the wastewater treatment plant are are well, are very well and also uh, related to the standards uh, it is okay there is like an extension of the irrigated area uh, with the with the, with the a treated uh, a treated water uh, we have for example the perimeter of uh, of msila uh, we calculated the need actually uh, the, the the national office of sanitation and the drainage is working on this project it is like to calculating the needs of of the of several project in order to to in in order to to have like a project of of uh, of irrigation using uh, the wastewater treatment plant treated. Yes, in terms of institutional framework, the project is like there is three three uh, main uh, ministry. The first one is the Ministry of Water Resources, the Minister of the Ministry. Uh, of agriculture and the Ministry of Public Health. Uh, they work on a creation of a coordination and a monitoring committee. Uh, the main, uh, the main uh, point or the main task were the rationalization of water resources management in agriculture and valorization of conventional and unconventional water, water resources. In terms of legal and uh, of legal framework, to ensure better protection of users and uh, consumers, studies have been launched by the Ministry of Water Resources uh, uh, related to the to the legislation. We have like uh, the first project was uh, is called Sindibad UNESCO project. It is for the implementation of the feasibility study on the integrated management. Uh, for uh, for uh, treated water in agriculture, and then uh, a textile uh, project. Four missions were developed by this project. The first one is the collection of all uh, basis data related to the to the water reuse. The study of a master plan for the reuse of treated uh, wastewater. Development of a pilot study of reuse, and it was the study of Hinaya. The reuse of treated wastewater for agriculture with definition of the type of crops and for industrial or other purposes. There is also like a, a several, uh, several uh, law. The first one uh, is the law number 512 uh, 
related to the water uh, for the concession of the use of treated uh, wastewater for the, for the irrigation purposes. There is also the decree number seven, uh, 149, lays down the term and condition for the concession, uh, concession of the use of treated wastewater for irrigation purpose, uh, purposes as well as the standard specification. There is also the interministerial decree which implement the provision of the article 2 of the executive decree number 7 uh, 149 published in the, in January uh, 2012 by the Ministry of Water Resources. These decrees establish the specification of treated uh, wastewater use for irrigation purposes and it in particular with regard to microbiological parameters and physicochemical parameters the list of crops that can be irrigated with the treated wastewater and the, uh, the, the last one is the algerian standard uh, related to the use of treated wastewater for agricultural municipal and the in, in industrial purposes physical chemical and biological specification uh, is available at the algerian institute of uh, standard the ongoing projects are the first one, uh, the impact of the treated wastewater irrigation on soil properties and groundwater quality. The second one is related to the uh, water use for agriculture as an adaptation measure to climate change. And that is with the, with the, office, uh, with the National Office of uh, Irrigation and you know, some studies related to the extension of the irrigated area uh, for reuse, especially in the in the in the Metija, which is the very important irrigated perimeter in Algeria, and there is some of uh, some uh, some uh, some data related to the to the surface, to the volume, to the area, to the doses, etc., and uh, the nature of the of the culture, etc. Uh, actually, the, the Algerian uh, Agency for the Integrated Water Research Management is working on the awareness aspect, uh, what, what should be done to reuse without major risk. Uh, this agency is, is working uh, in order to raising the farmers' uh, awareness for, uh, of the benefit of reusing treated water in irrigation. The application of the uh, regulatory framework, the crops to be grown, and the recommended irrigation system, and then the, the establishment of a training, uh, supervision, and extension program, and then to improve the inter uh, sectoral coordination. Uh, actually, uh, uh, the, the, ministry, the Ministry of Water Resources is, is leading the operation, and there is like a a three uh, different stru structure. It is like the the office, uh, the national office of sanitation, and uh, the national office of sanitation. Sorry, the national office of uh, of uh, office of irrigation and the drainage, and the, the Algerian agency for uh, integrated resource uh, water resource management are working together in order to to give like uh, or to develop this kind of project in in a better way. Yes, finally, I will uh, invite all the speakers, yes, as, as an institute. I'll give you just uh, an information that we are preparing an international symposium related to the flash flood in YT system. We can just say the date, it will be uh, next, next June. And there is no, no fees, it will be physically, and there is no fees for, for the participation. Welcome to Clemson, and uh, thank you so much for your attention. The floor is yours, uh, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much, uh, Professor. Um, uh, uh, this 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 was most most enjoyable uh, uh, listening to the experience uh, of what wastewater usage, uh, in particular the improved yields as a result of uh, that that water reuse. Uh, I, I think I might also just add that we. The, in, in North Africa, access to electricity is is almost 100 uh, percent, but in, in in Southern Africa, we are looking at something like 43 percent. So I think there might be need to to look at that that whole thing as to how do we then maybe also give you the 
uh, they give you the products that you are trying to uh, to, to 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 grow using uh, wastewater when we uh, we may want to also increase our access thank you very much thank you, um, thank thank you. my next presenter is alex bite uh, financial advisor and owner of uh, uh, global strategic advisory group uh, he's a chartered electrical mechanical engineer by profession with a military background. Uh, since 2000, he has been involved in structuring project finance and acquisition and delivery of me mega infrastructure projects. I think his topic is going to answer the question that was raised in terms of financing of the water and energy infrastructure. Uh, the two have to go hand in hand, energy and water. As engineer Munodawa mentioned, that the energy investments would also include investments in water infrastructure. Over to you, uh, Alex. Sorry, Mr. Baird, you are muted. No. Good morning uh, to everybody and many thanks for uh, for all the presentations that have been put on the table because uh, I think uh, it gives a, a wider perspective in terms of what the challenges are and where we as Africans can get to uh, just by kind of harnessing what we have on the table and utilizing the resources that we have as well as the collateral experience of everybody around the table. So I think, uh, Mr. Chair, I think uh, the panel uh, gave a, a fairly broad outline of where we are today, where we can potentially be in the future. And I think that's a very important uh, proposition that I think we can collateralize and commercialize for what we need to get done. As uh, the chair mentioned, uh, my name is Alec Baird. Uh, I've spent a lot of my uh, adult life, uh, mostly in, uh, in the Middle East, Asia and Africa to a large extent. Uh, I've most recently focused our, our, our focuses from uh, Asia uh, to, from the Middle East, Asia to Africa, where we believe that's going to be the next frontier. Certainly the amount of interest that we see globally going into Africa is phenomenal. And uh, it's become the crossroads of the East, West, the North and the South. And, and I think that is the first time in Africa that we've got a, a way to preposition ourselves in such a way that can uh, untap a lot of potential. Now, my, my main focus as well, coming from the bench has pretty much been doing mega programs. And these are either in the oil and gas sector, which then drives power projects or water retriculation plants in terms of desalination and all the experience we've learned in the Middle East. So these are huge mega programs that are very much electrical, electricity driven, as well as water driven, but they are also part of an ecosystem that is fundamental for any economic growth, not only in the Middle East or Asia, but also in Europe, where if we kind of focus in on what has happened in the last 400 years of the Industrial Revolution, Okay, so this then transacts us and moves us into where the space we are in. Now, in listening to all the all the conversations that everybody has put on the table, what's been very obvious to us is that there is a potential now to solve an African problem with an African solution by bringing in a, a very integrated uh, financial package or solution that would be able to untap a lot of that resources to do what we need to get done. Now, I'm from a military background, so program management is very key for me. So I understand complex projects and uh, multiple integrated projects that drive that. I also understand the financial structures that are, are required from an investor to understand why they would want to put money into these projects, which is also very equally important for what I'm going to talk about today. So whether that uh, uh, finance is coming in, in uh, whether it is direct foreign investment or is a bilateral, that comes with its own challenges as well. But also the other thing that also I want to touch on from a program management is the operations and the support of these infrastructures that are built. Because an investor wants his return of investment over time, he needs his buyback. He needs to also make money on the investment because it's all institutional investment money. Now. The, the challenge that we have in Africa today is that there are traditional routes that we've tried to do a lot of these power projects, whether they be water, 
or whether there be power. Now, I've had long discussions uh, with the chair around what is really important in Africa. And I believe real power, electricity in Africa is the force multiplier that can change the face of Africa because it drives so many cogs in a gearbox, whether it be agriculture, manufacturing, education, telecommunications, and that is where we are at Africa. So, so if you look at the demand for power that will enable Africa to be a powerhouse, there is a gap that needs to be filled. But we are hamstrung in Africa because of the ability to access funding. Now, if we look at the traditional models that have been out there, uh, which may be around build and operate, PPPs, uh, they come up with their own challenges of being able to, to drive uh, from, from start to finish of raising funding that is very bureaucratic, bureaucratic. And it involves government, it involves so many different entities, whether it be regional economic blocks. So it becomes very difficult to close or have a commercial closure to raise funding. And as you know, in Africa or anywhere else in the world, we got a, a, a tenure period where the political dynamics change every five years. And sometimes to raise funding for some of these projects can exceed five years. And then it's a vicious circle and nothing ever gets done. And also in Africa, we don't really quite understand the, the BOT models to, to a large extent and the PP models. Because even in the Middle East, when we were there up until about 18, 2018, 2019, investors also struggled at that level, which is a much more mature environment than what we are talking about here today in Africa or Asia for that matter. So there's always going to be a gap that we're going to have to face. The other thing that also comes to, to a challenge for us in Africa is the, the different organizations that are involved. Uh, you've got the, e, uh, the European Union, you've got uh, the IMF, you've got the World Bank. And sad, sadly to say, most of these people are academics. And, uh, and I think everybody that we spoke, that spoke today on this platform are all from the bench. They are all engineers. They all understand what needs to get done. Uh, so the, when I was asked to talk about this, I was kind of bringing my experience from a technical perspective and a delivery perspective, wrapping that into the financial structures that we are doing today. I spend more time doing fundraising and delivery of that uh, capability in, in terms of project insertions to get these projects done. Now I understand where some of these challenges are, and that's why I hope today my interaction with you, I'm not doing a presentation, I'm just going to talk around the challenges we have because some of the hybrid solutions we are bringing are very much um, uh, ahead of its time. And I think the best way I can kind of explain this is to kind of talk through it and get through panel discussions. And hopefully on the back of this presentation, it will lead to other things that will kind of drive some of the conversations that we are going to have today. So we talked about the model that is currently used in Africa, uh, whether it be uh, the PPPs or BOTs or boots, then you've got the IMF and all the different institutions that have a say in some of these projects. Uh, then we've also got the issue that we've always been hamstrung with in Africa, which is the debt and legacy issue around that, which doesn't give us the ability to uh, securitize our assets, to create a sovereign guarantee that allows us to actually go out there and do some of these projects as a government or governments per se or economic blocks for that matter. Now, this has a lot of challenges that we currently have today that I think these are the issues that I'm, I'm spent the last three, four years trying to put together and come up with solutions that are bespoke, that are going to be suited for African environments that address all these issues. Now, that's all emanating from a private sector. Uh, I'm a firm believer that it's only the private sector that can address some of the challenges that we have today, uh, whether we are in North Africa or West Africa, East or South, the, the common denominator is the same. We, do, we may have a skill set, we may have a diaspora of skill sets, but they are not in Africa. We, we, we need to package our projects in such a way that it ticks all the boxes but addresses the African uh, objectives while buying in from the governments to support these initiatives. The private sector then wraps these deals 
or these projects you know in a finance package that is workable now there are kind of four elements that i kind of work in the space with uh we are as a, we are out of a singaporean jurisdiction we are also out of a, a middle east jurisdiction which works into africa i am based in london which gives me a pool of access to investment monies not only european but also american and because london is the financial capital that kind of does a lot of these capital raises and what do i have in front of me that i can take and package these to drive these agendas so i also want to add one thing that an element i'm going to talk about but i'm going to add that to the last of this private sector discussion i'm going to have so we got access to hedge funds within the hedge funds you got derivatives as well these are all open markets where you got investment money available to invest as long as the opportunity makes sense for the investor most of the investors in in europe all they want is a return on the investment the one guarantees i think someone talked about the sovereign guarantees that countries cannot provide but the sovereign guarantees today we've come up with so many different ways to to secure that you've got to put in call uh, We've got ways of securitizing a return on an investment over time, linking that to a hedge fund coupon return. Now, a lot of these structures are, seem complex, but when you actually distill it down to something that we're currently working in, in Africa, in West Africa, and in Southern Africa, uh, it has taken us a long time to get there, but we can see the reality of it. Okay, so we got the hedge funds, we got the derivative markets, uh, and I'm not talking about stock, stock change, uh, stock markets. I'm just talking about pure investment funds that we've got access to at a, at a reasonable discounted rate. We then also talk about the other private investment arms that are out there, which are a very much coupon return, where you've got organizations that are willing to, to raise a bond float it on a stock exchange market, raise five, 600 million euros, that is got a return investment of let's say five to 10 years, but the jurisdiction of where that money is used is ring fenced in, in some of the jurisdictions we're talking about. Investors will invest in Qatar, they will invest in, uh, in Singapore because they feel that there is some form of surety. There's a BIPA or there is a multilateral investment agency that protects their investment. But you can also ring fence those investments in Singapore to an African jurisdiction, which is acceptable globally, which could be the Mauritius, which could be Seychelles. And it distills down to the project level itself. So it, it may seem complex, it may seem complicated, but some of these models now are working very easily and are, are easily put together. So whether I want to raise a, a guaranteed bond, or whether I want to raise an institutional bond for 10 years at 3%, because what is happening in Europe, most of Europe is built up and the institutions need to put their money to raise enough return for those investors. And you can see what is happening in Europe with the negative interest rates, with the inflation. So everybody is looking at these emerging markets and Africa offers that to us. And that's why it's so important for us to kind of understand the process that we need to do from where we are and where we need to get to. We've also got a lot of uh, investment houses now that are coming up under the umbrellas of family offices, which are sovereign funds, whether it be Singaporean, whether it be the Qataris, the UAE government, could be even the Americas. So the, the opportunities we have there are, are available but it's all private sector driven. So how do we merge private sector, government, and what the institutions that uh, I think we, we heard about today, we heard about SAP. SAP is an excellent model that we've used in the last six months, come up with a model that we're currently working on, which we believe is gonna be a game changer and a force multiplier in Africa. But the moment we, we, we unleash it, it becomes a standard. And it is a standard that, that can work either for electricity producing power or trading power or investment in power and the same principle can apply for water projects 
So there's a lot of similarities. I think that, uh, there was a, a conversation about where electricity and water go hand in hand. Excellent combination. Uh, in the Middle East, when we were in the Middle East, defense and oil and gas went together because you needed the defense to secure the oil and gas so it produces and the crude flows. But you also need the, the crude and the gas to pay for the defense. So it's, it's a hand in glove situation. And I think that's a model that worked in the Middle East. And with close adaption to that model, it can be the same applicable into Africa for that matter. Now, what we've also started to see uh, certainly in Europe is that there's a huge diaspora of Africans that are overseas. They may not necessarily invest in a project that's in Zimbabwe or Zambia for that matter. But if there's a, a commercial structure that gives them a return, that they become part of something that is African, they will put money in it. So we are starting to see a lot of funds coming up, diaspora funds, which are invested as hedge funds, focusing at Africa, but mostly in the power and the agricultural sector. So the model is there already. It is moving in the direction that we want it to go. So I think I talked about quite a wide spectrum of things there, but I think I'm, I'm just going to kind of distill it down into some key things that I think everybody needs to understand. The jurisdiction that we operate has to give an environment that allows people to put money or to invest. So I talked about Seychelles, I talked about Mauritius. Those are offshore assets or offshore jurisdictions that people will invest in as long as they're underwritten with the first with a, with a first world financial institution, like in a jurisdiction of Singapore or London. Everybody understands it. The, but the significance of Seychelles and Mauritius per se is that they are part of Africa. So they address the African requirements, but whilst also addressing the international requirements from a compliance point of view. All right. So that whole link is all part and parcel of putting these packages together. The other thing that I, I, I think I want to kind of talk about is also the country profiles that we have. There are certain parts of Africa that investors are willing to invest in without, without a drop of a, of a coin. Classic example is Botswana. Uh, investors want to go into Botswana, but Botswana doesn't give them the captive market in whatever industry that they want to get into that gives them scale and return of their investment. But if it is around power, which is going sitting on a Southern African power pool, they are all for it. And actually part of our structures that we are doing is linking into, into Botswana for that matter. But it's also a jurisdiction that is accepted in Seychelles, Singapore, Mauritius, London, and the US. So the, the, the long and short of it from a country profile is also equally important. I'm gonna be also frank. If I said to an investor today, I want to go invest in the Central African Republic, most of them will say no. Okay, but if I go to a benign environment, Zimbabwe, Zambia, South Africa, Algeria for that matter, I think there is a lot of potential that could be untapped to be able to drive that. And also the other thing that what gives a lot of the investors that we've seen in the last, uh, I would say two years is that Africa is quite organized in terms of economic blocks with its ECOWAS in West Africa, SADC in Southern Africa, or, or COMESA, or, or the, new, uh, the new African economic bloc that's been set after. I mean, all of these are all part of parcel of frameworks. You know, it was encouraging to hear Professor Naidi talking about some of the history where we've come from. We've come from 1994, 95. Some of these frameworks have been in place. And the structures are there, the policies are there, these guidelines, the compliance part is there. It's how do we take that, package it to address a country profile in terms of its, its economic risk, its sovereign risk, and its country risk. And these are the, the type of things that we are working on together to kind of drive those agendas to get some investment put, in, put into place. Now, if I look at all the 
the countries that are available right now and the, and the sectors that we are talking about. I know we are talking about SAP, where we believe SAP is going to be the game changer in the next three to four years. Uh, I spend a lot of time in various line ministries of energy discussing about the power challenges. South Africa is no exception, where everyone is talking about we're going to get this sorted out. But the reality is, is this. It's going to take five years to get a new capacity on the line. Five years. That's assuming that there's no problem in the world in terms of logistics and supply chains. Now, that is if I'm building a thermal power station, which is a, goes against the odds of what's happening in Europe, where they do not want to invest in thermal power stations using coal, as an example. Second point that I, I'd like to also put on the table. If we are to go down on the nuclear side, it takes us seven to eight years to get a nuclear power station up. And even the more modular nuclear power stations at 100 megawatts, that is still going to take you about six, seven years. But the compliance around that, that need to address everything else from a security point of view, national security, Africa security, we are not in the decision making process of that. It's in the hands of external, external parties. So nuclear is out. Thermal power station has got its challenges. Hydro is the is the way forward. It is green. And if I listened to the conversation uh, from uh, the the presentation slide that was given on the ZRA as Marble River Authority and what it's doing and the ten gorges from Dr. Gata, that is the future. But we need to find a way to untap that, right? So th the investment to drive those projects are huge capital investments, which will take us time to raise that amount of money. Okay, so it has to be done in chunk sizes. The other thing that I also want to kind of touch whilst we're talking about thermal or nuclear or wind for that matter, in Africa, we need bulk power. I know there's a lot of conversation around solar, everyone wants to push solar, but the reality of it is uh, for, for Africa to get out of the rut that it's in and to actually drive the transition of energy, we need bulk power and lots of it. And from the presentations I've seen today is that uh, we don't need to make this up. The, the projects are there. And the ability and the capacity for us to do these projects is there. So even the project that's happening in, in Kariba, where it's probably being managed by, uh, by, by an African consortia to manage that, just is testament that we can do it. We don't need third parties to do it. We can do it ourselves. And part of that package that we put together allows an ability to cross-train and upskill our own people in Africa to be able to not only look at it from a commercial point of view and a project delivery point of view, but from an operation point of view with a commercial hat in mind to say, how do we monetize this? Now, we believe that the focus in Africa right now is linked to two things as uh, a, a from a finance, financial point of view in terms of return. And I think that is around centered around two main aspects. Agriculture, because we need to feed ourselves. Secondly, agriculture is also very dependent on power in terms of scale, in terms of irrigation that is required to do that. Uh, so the issue about water and the electricity is fundamental from a socioeconomic point of view and a political stability point of view. The secondary part to that is the mining. The mining is the next biggest invest, is the next frontier for Africa. We are well in down with minerals that no other continent has got. But in order to extract that, we need the means to be able to benefit those before they are re-exported out of Africa. And to do that, we need power. So if you couple the demand of the minerals that need to be processed locally and the power needs for that, that is where the opportunity for us lies. Now, I talked about building a power station that would take us four, four to five years to build it. That's in, in a best case scenario. In a worst case scenario, maybe the power station may never get built. So we've kind of worked in the last 12, 14 months with, uh, with our partners in Africa to come out okay we are where we are but we need power today and tomorrow so how do we structure these 
that scenario that allows us to be able to function, give access to power to people who really need it, using such frameworks as SAP. And, uh, and what we've kind of saw in the last four to six months in our interactions in this space, and, uh, and, I'm, uh, and I'm sure our chair will, will, will be testament to this at, at, at a later stage, but we found a way to, to kind of say, guys, the power producers, uh, whether it be Kabora Bassa, whether it be Kariba, whether it be uh, Kafui Gorge, we've, we've come up with a, with a commercial structure that allows two things to happen. One, be able to take power from them and give it to someone who demands it, but using a framework that is already established, that is secure, a platform that is in play. But what we've been able to do is to come up with a commercial structure that safeguards the parties that are providing the power. So whether it be Kabora Basa or Kuriba South or North or Kafui Gorge. And we've ring-fenced that and underwritten that through Lloyds of London or Marsh Insurance as the underwriters to protect their in the they power, they their payments into their power. So two things happen. We are not building a power station. But what we have just done is that we've used what's in front of us to commercialize it in such a way where the producers of the power have got access to funding in a US dollar based uh, uh, currency. They've got the ability to offset their debts through a structured mechanism in how that power is fully utilized using a, using a, a SAP structure similar to a SAP structure. We got an ability to give momentum to the mining companies or the agricultural companies to have certainty about pumping water, about mining, about being able to benefit their minerals, which are all, by the way, indexed to an export receipt in US dollar. So you, you ring fencing your US dollar export receipts, which is high value because you've already benefited in Africa locally. But to do that, you need the power. So that allows the value add to, to, to be incre incremental over time. You've got mining companies that are able now to plan ahead. They are paying for their power in advance. The financial structure of a billion plus or $500 million guarantees that we have through an institution in a commercial setting underwrites that. So no one is exposed for any commercial risk, right? And I think as time goes by within the next three to four months, a lot of these type of concepts become a reality. And the, the most important thing that, that comes out there is that we are addressing a problem, not by creating a, a situation where the countries become more heavily in debt, but what this does, what this option does, it untaps ability of confidence internationally for people to put more money in these sort of structures or funds. That's one. Two, it allows planning long term for these institutions. Three, it gives them resources in a US dollar index to address the internal debts, but also to maintain the capacities, but also create a war chest of funding which they themselves over time will actually build up to be able to have a certain amount of, of funding, which they could go out to institutions and say, look, this is the model we have. This is what we, we, we've we managed to accomplish in the last three, four years. And then we're sitting on $300 million. That is what we want to securitize that, to put it as a, 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 as a collateral to borrow for further expansion. So it, it's a net effect. So what we're trying to say is that over the next three to five years, rather than us waiting for five years for someone to build a power station that can address the issues that we have today, we've got a solution in front of us. And that solution is, is the way I've just explained it to you. Now, I would have loved to put this on, uh, on presentations to yourself, but there's a legal aspect to it and there's an IP 
aspect to it. And that's one of the reasons that when we were kind of talking with our team in terms of what do we put on the table, it becomes very difficult. So we are at the crossroads of getting that moving in that direction. But I think uh, from a conceptual point of view, I know we're going to do a question and answer session after this, but I think it's something that I can also try and bring more clarity. And I'm hoping with people that are around the table today, we'll be able to talk about this much more in the future with all the parties that are around the table. But I also want to kind of talk about the last part of what I'm talking about, which is around uh, security in, in a nutshell. Um, I think there was a, the, the, the second presentation we heard today was around uh, an overview of SAP. Now, SAP, in my view, with what I saw today and also the interactions we've had on SAP through our engagement on, on, on trying to set up some of these financial structures, especially like a, on a bank guarantee kind of thing, was that it's an organization that is very well structured. It's got a charter. It's got rules. The playbook is well written. It's clear. But not many people know about it out there. So it's the same project, it's, it's, it's the same scenarios that we have that we are going to be faced. Should we try and wait for someone to come and look at our projects or what we're trying to do? So the point I'm trying to put across is that we've already got frameworks. It's just how do we collaborate as a group uh, to, to come up with a solution that works for us in the short to medium term. The long term is the bigger hydro projects that we heard uh, from ZRA and uh, the esteemed speaker. When, uh, you, when I was talking about the 10 gorges or for Dr. Gata's concept. It's, it, it looks far, but in reality, it, it is something that's gonna happen, irregardless of whether it happens today or tomorrow, but it's already in play. But right now, we're trying to come up with a formula that instills confidence, okay? Now, the way we feel we, we can get this done is to do a proof, uh, it's not a proof of concept because the frameworks are already in place. It's about being able to, to, to give this example as I'm gonna put it out on the table. Let's assume we got a mining company in Zimbabwe that needs power. And they are hamstrung because they got load sheddings, but not that they can't afford the, the power. They, 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 their hamstrung is that they cannot get to scale. And in mining terms, 40% of your cost base is either fuel or power or both combined, depending on how you're producing your power. So we typical example is they want to be able to have surety that they can get power when they need it and on demand. And they can say, you know what? We want to use 50 megawatts of power for the next 12 months, but we want an escalation of 10% of that 50 megawatts should in case we need to increase our shifts or increase production. How that works is that mining is a very simple mathematics. You know what you're mining, you know where, how much you need to get out, you need to know how much you need to process, and the price of gold or the minerals that you are producing is pretty much set within a parameter. The only variable is your exchange rate in a nutshell. Now, take a fact that you don't have power, the biggest variable then becomes power that either determines whether you make money or you don't make money. So we've got instances where a mining company will come and say, you know, guys, I want to be able to put a structure that allows us to, to have access to power. I want to be able to buy power through a structure that actually works, but I also want to be ring-fenced that should I don't get that power, there's a mechanism in which I can be compensated. That's where we part and parcel of our structures are. It gives protection to the mining operator. Two, it also allows that mining operator to maintain the narrative that goes out to their shareholders. Because once a shareholder knows that there's a power shortage here, they know the, the, the dividends are affected, the share price is going to be affected, the net present value of that mine drops. But if you come up with a wrapper that allows that that doesn't happen over time and you've got certainty 
that by the time you get to Q4 of your financial year, you've hit your targets. That is what a mining company wants to hear. The same thing for agriculture. And it's the same thing for anyone who wants to want water for the agriculture, who wants water for the manufacturing capacities, because that's going to be the next challenge. Everyone needs drinkable water, industrial water. Even if you recirculate that water, you, you, each time you recycle water, you lose a percentage. So you're always in the negative. So these type of models that I'm talking about, these financial structures, will just untap an ability to get funding to invest in these structures. And you're using SAP as the example to do that. So coming back to the mining company, one, they've got certainty. They can produce more. They can make more. The exports are indexed to a US dollar account. They are paying for their power in US dollar account. Everybody along the food chain and the supply chain benefits. And that's what we need. That is the force multiplier we need in Africa. And that is the solution for us to move forward. Um, and I think uh, without getting into the mechanics of it, uh, I, I would like to believe that this type of sessions, these type of forums is that's when we get that message out to everybody to understand what is the potential we can un untap. And I think, Mr. Chair, um, I think on that note, I'd like this to be much more interactive questions and answers, and I will try and support as best as I can in terms of that narrative. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Alex. Uh, yeah, I think uh, the only problem now I have is I am 30 minutes outside my allocated time, uh, mainly because uh, everyone who's presented has, has, has been has been very good. Uh, I mean, the 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 information has been uh, well presented, and and so I'd like to ask uh, Madam Coordinator: Is the am I allowed an additional ten minutes? Uh, just to... um, no problem, Mr. Masawi. You can carry on until we finished. The webinar will continue until we say thank you. Oh, okay, okay, but we don't want to because we didn't. I, I obviously was having problems with time management, but uh, we don't want people to be um, uh, unduly inconvenienced. We didn't have a biological break, so I think what I, what I, what I'm going to do now is to uh, request uh, questions on each on any of the uh, 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 six presentations that, that we have. And then I'm calling on all the presenters now to become uh, uh, the, a panel uh, that would then uh, provide this interactive uh, session for the next uh, 10, 10 minutes or so, depending on the questions that, that, that are coming from the audiences. Uh, now, I'm not sure how the questions are going to be. Is there, uh, is there uh, some hand? Uh, um, a uh, hand? Francis, we have a few questions. Um, if you mind, if you don't mind, we can combine the questions with the panel discussion. So if I can ask all the presenters, the panelists, to please activate your webcams. And then as we ask, the, I'll ask the questions for you and then you can direct it to the relevant presenter. If that makes it easier. Yes, thank you. Okay, excellent. So the, the, right. the questions, the questions, have they been uh, compiled somewhere or they'll be asked so as we go on? On the control panel, there's a questions drop down menu for you to see, and there you can see all the questions that's been posted so far. Oh, okay. Can you see that? Yes, I can see. Yes, I can see that. Oh, okay, good, good. Um, uh, there are questions. Uh, the three questions from Agai Stole. Um, let me. 
Okay, the first one is directed to Engineer Masango. Uh, has the SAP helped at all in terms of containing load shedding? Um, let me just put this better. The question is that okay. at, at Virginia Masangu, I'll just take, I'll just help you there, Francis. The question ah. is, has the SAPP helped at all in terms of containing load shedding frequencies in countries like South Africa? Question from Mr. Hagai Satoli. And, and I think he's also said, yeah, uh, and, and, and Zimbabwe. Zimbabwe. Yeah. Engineer Masangu? Uh, thank you, thank you for the question. Um, I, I, I know probably the issue is coming from the fact that we're still seeing quite a lot of load shedding happening at the moment. But what I can share is that indeed the SAP has tried to, to, to minimize the amount of load shedding that is happening, obviously being limited by the amount of generation capacity that is actually available currently in the region. But um, I, I can confirm that uh, South Africa is at the moment does have access to the markets and are able to buy power. Um, similarly, um, Zesa uh, from Zimbabwe actually also has access to the markets and, and is able to, to buy power when they, they need it the most to, to limit um, the amount of load shedding they have to do and in some cases to avoid load shedding altogether. But yes, um, there's still more that can be done, including um, improvement in the uh, generation space as well as the transmission space. Uh, and I can confirm that as a pool, power pool, we have what we call the uh, sub pool plan, which actually lays out the plan of uh, the development of transmission and generation projects um, uh, going forward. And um, it was developed in 2017. It is currently under um a review so yes there's still more to be done and we are working on that thank you maybe engineer the the, the, the question uh, i don't know um uh, mr stole maybe without reading uh, i think maybe the question is 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 is, is more maybe if I, if i if i can assist in putting it in a different uh, way the Southern African Power Pool was created in 1995 to, 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 for members to pool resources and assist each other in times of emergencies. And, and I think everyone agrees that we are in times of emergencies. So the, I think the question was saying, well, what, what, what is the SAP doing now uh, now that uh, we are in, in times of emergencies, load shedding, uh, to try and get us out of the emergencies. I, I'll, I'll, give, I'll, give a, I'll, I'll give a reason why I'm, I'm asking this question, and I think Prof, Prof Naidu would come in. In, in 1998, thereabouts, uh, we, in the SAP, four years, five years after interconnections in 1996, we had a problem with uh, synchronization, you know, you know uh, and also we had one, one issue called um, small signal oscillations on the, on the power network. And the SAP set up a team. Uh, the current executive uh, uh, director is, was on the team to study the, south, the small signal oscillations problem, which was affecting everyone in the, in the SAP. And uh, now that problem was actually resolved. Um, but but uh, so the 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 aspect of helping each other in terms of emergencies worked before. But is it working now? And why is it not working now? I think maybe that was the question. I don't know if Prof Prof Nadi you want to come in. No, you covered it well, Chairman. You covered it well. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Francis. Um, 
I, I note the, the, the question, and yes, indeed, as I've uh, tried to explain uh, before, we are assist, assisting one another. Um, the example that you've uh, actually um, come up with is a bit different from what we have at the moment, um, uh, but definitely those are some of the ways that we try and assist one another. The current problem actually talks to generation capacity, and probably it's it's, it's sort of divided into two. There is the issue of uh, maybe the um, uh, energy availability factor. The, the the problems that we are facing also has to do with the um, outages that we are seeing in terms of the generation uh, plans. Um, in that regard, we have the um, operating subcommittee which is also we're working together to try and find a solution uh, in terms of the, uh, ensuring that the, the, the energy availability factor actually improves. But in terms of the installed capacity, uh, you will recognize that um, it, it's, it, it's not something that you can actually resolve in just a second uh, or one month. Um, generation projects generally take quite a long time to uh, put together, um, but it's there's, there's work that started a long time ago. I've talked about the subpower pool, uh, which was actually um, issued in 2017, uh, which is currently what the, the countries are actually trying to follow in terms of the development of the uh, projects. But also, we have uh, we are coming up with what we call the regional transmission infrastructure financing facility, which is a project that recognizes that. Um, the development of the transmission infrastructure has been quite low over the uh, past two year, years, uh, simply because you know transmission lines are generally considered as costs, and the involvement of private sector has been uh, relatively non-existent. So we are trying to pull these resources, these uh, new sources of finance together through this uh, uh, financing facility, where even the private sector now can actually pa participate and be able to invest in this uh, portfolio of projects. We've already identified some of these uh, first mover projects uh, that we believe can be financed uh, through the uh, regional transmission infrastructure uh, financing facility. So it's, it's, it's again, unfortunately, it's not something that you will expect to be up and running like in the next month, but we, we do believe by the end of the following calendar year, we'll have such a facility in place and we'll be able to the funding can, coming in and, and start financing these um, the regional transmission projects. Thank, thank you. Uh, thank you, engineer. Um, the, the other question from Hagai uh, 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 to you, engineer, is uh, how are disputes between member states revo resolved, e.g. non-payment for energy board? Is there a sub Ombudsman. In terms of the operation of the, sorry, I had to turn off my camera here. It's telling me that the network is quite slow. Um, so I'm hoping now you can hear me clearly if there were any issues. Previously, um, the operate the markets are actually operated uh, on a prepayment system, which means uh, for one to be able to purchase uh, power or energy, they need to have enough uh, security to cover those uh, purchases. And we constantly advise members whenever they are running low on that uh, cover to actually replenish so that we never default on payment. So luckily, we've never had such uh, issues uh, in terms of uh, non-payment of uh, delivered power. Uh, but for other issues, um, um, not necessarily related to payment, um, I've talked about the governance documents that we have. We certainly do try, especially if it relates to the operation of the SAPP or the interconnected uh, power grid, we always try to come in as the sub uh, between those members and try to ensure that we provide enough information to just to clarify any issues that the members may have. 
um, and and so far it's it's uh, it's it's been working where uh, as the subsidy we were able to then help guide the the members and and in the process help them uh, resolve any any disputes or, or disagreements that they may be having thank you thank you thank you engineer i think maybe just to add uh, the I, I think maybe to uh, to help uh, engineer stole on 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 his question i think uh, the the non payment for energy delivered re relates mostly to bilateral uh, trades so specifically there is bilateral trades between zimbabwe and uh, and kabora basa zimbabwe and uh, zesco and edm and and, and 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 so forth now uh, because there are bilateral uh, issues they would then have to be addressed on a bilateral level as opposed to coming to be resolved on a on a on a on a sub uh, sub level uh, the other question from uh, the last question from uh, engineer stole is to professor um uh, sherifa uh, what are some of the crops that cannot be irrigated with treated water in in algeria yes thank you so much for the question yes there is uh, for example actually uh, for the uh, it is okay for the irrigation of the trees but uh, for example for the for the tomatoes the potatoes uh, uh, for for this there is it is not it is not possible to to use because there is uh, there is some recommendation related to the to the, to the water quality uh, there is some projects actually uh, working on how to improve uh, the the the, uh, the the quality of the water by by adding like a, like a third process related to the to the disinfection of water in order to to use uh, at the output of the wastewater treatment plant uh, the water for for all types of of crops thank thank you professor um welcome yeah um now to come back to the theme of this uh, this uh, 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 webinar towards the Southern African Power Pool, uh, I think uh, the presentation from uh, Engineer Munodawafa said it all. Uh, I, I think from what he said uh, in terms of uh, activities that are already uh, in place uh, in terms of uh, uh, those those um, the, the 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 reservoir above the victoria falls the pipelines planned from zambezi river to 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 the to 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 to, to, to possibly to Botswana and south africa limpopo to south africa and and studies carried out to get uh, Congo River uh, to the Zambezi River and then the Luapula Basin. It actually appears as if the the framework in dealing with the supply side of uh, the Southern African water pool is already in place, uh, and and therefore I think it's it's a mechanism that um, that would be. Um, is a mechanism that now requires putting in in place uh, the actual infrastructure of the of the Southern African water pool in terms of governance, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, I will go around to my panelists now uh, to uh, in making in commenting on that that the, the the theme in others from their own presentations how they see uh this progression towards a southern african water pool is resolving the water crisis that we've had uh, for example south africa is going to face a serious problem in the next uh, three three to four years i'll start with professor sharifa 
as, as someone who's actually uh, not in the region, uh, from what you've heard, is, is, is this a solution that we need to seriously pursue in terms of addressing water security in Southern Africa? Thank you for the question. Honestly, I haven't like a, a clear idea about uh, the situation of water resources in South Africa, but uh, maybe uh, as Algerian uh, as Algerian citizen, uh, for us the 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 destination and for us like uh, uh, was an alternative solution to 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 resolve a part of of the problem. Uh, I, I, there is also like a mechanism into how, how to improve the management of the network of the supply water supply network or water distribution network in order to, to have like a, a excellent performance in order to, to, to distribute uh, to distribute the water uh, with an intelligent like uh, way. Uh, uh, I don't know also if there is like a possibility to reuse for uh, in South Africa to reuse water uh, for for different uh, purposes, just, uh, not just for for agriculture, um, uh, uh, with the, with the capacities. Uh, I know that for the South Africa there is like a, if there is a possibility to use like a new technologies related to use like the wastewater for also another uh, purpose like for for example for for the industrial for the for the domestic etc yes i don't know if i i give like a part of uh, of uh, all or a clear answer to to your uh, to your question yes yes thank you thank, thank you professor one of the one of the lessons that we're learning from the southern african power pool is is the fact that we mixed we mixed the supply issues and the demand and we wanted we wanted the power utilities who are really the members the original members of the southern african power pool to look at both the supply and the demand side and i think <laughs> we can't do both it's 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 just not possible and 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 the proof is there we need we need some entity to address the the, the demand side uh, separately from the from the supply side and i think government entities are actually in a better place to be managing the supply side in terms of cross border infrastructure that sort of thing but when it comes to trade i think that must go to the private sector uh, uh, who, who, who are probably best able to manage the, the supply risk, uh, supply risks. Uh, then the, my next panelist uh, on this particular round is uh, Alex. Uh, you, have, you, have, you have shown us the, the ways that we can actually go uh, uh, about financing the infrastructure. Uh, but do you see setting up a Southern African water pool as a solution, as a viable solution to the water crisis in Southern Africa? Yeah, uh, thanks, uh, thanks a lot for that, Chair. Um, look, uh, water is life and it's inev inevitable. Uh, South Africa has got uh, its challenges in the next two to three years as we see it. So the proposition, I think, is already there in the making. I think I'm aware of three or four dams that are being built in the southern part of Zimbabwe that are supposed to be supplying water to the Limpopo. Uh, I know there's a capital fundraise that's happening out of France and I think out of Brussels to that effect. So there's already some groundwork that has already started to go down that route. But of course, they are falling down the route of traditional financial structures. OK, so I think there is a, there's a meeting of minds and a meeting of roads there that could address that, ch that challenge as well. And uh, also just to put it into context, these two projects I'm talking about that I've just given specifics to uh, a combination of not water supply, but also hydro capacities as well. So I, I, I think the, the moral to the, to the story is that, yes, I see uh, a water pool uh, is essential. 
I think if we also listen to, to, to the way water could be rechanneled from going into the Pacific and the Atlantic down to, uh, down to other parts of Southern Africa into catchment areas, I think that's an excellent uh, approach. And I know there's visibility is being done in that space. So I do agree, yes. Uh, it, it, it's just to get that seed out so people can understand what is available and where it is available. I will also point out that these two dams are going to be operated as private enterprise. It's got nothing to do. Government may have a say in it from a strategic water supply perspective. Yes. But the off takers are all private off takers. This is the business case that I've seen. And that capital raise has started, I think, in earnest just on the back of 2021, August. And, uh, and there was a lot of uptake and interest in that as well. So I do agree that this is possibly a, a way forward. Thank you, Alex. Uh, Engineer Mnodawafa, uh, you, 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 you posed the challenge of, of financing. I don't know if you have uh, comments on after listening to what Alex has, has said. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Uh, yes, indeed, uh, everywhere, whatever infrastructure development issue, that comes out the challenges for financing and coming up with bankable projects is a, is something which is um on the on the forefront but what i appreciated from alex's uh, point of view is the issue of the private sector involvement there's no way anything to that sector can work without the private sector uh, being given their uh, their place in the, in these developmental issues. Yes, we have to involve them, and uh, obviously look at some of those uncharted areas in terms of uh, um, we are talking of pension funds and even individual individual funding coming from individuals. All that should be honest, but uh, yes, the solution falls into the private sector involvement more than anything else for these projects to, to, to be realized. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, engineer. Um, um, Dr. Daniel, uh, uh, the, 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 the issues you raised, the, the, your presentation uh, presents tremendous opportunities for the private sector. And, and tremendous opportunities for the for Africans to to really become in charge. If 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 you are looking at 100 megawatts, 100,000 megawatts of, uh, of, uh, of of green energy hydropower, uh, uh, I was just trying to calculate the amount of carbon dioxide emissions reductions that emanate from 100,000 megawatts. I mean. The, the, the plan to finance itself. I mean, you, 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 if, you, if you are selling, uh, if, you are, if you are offsetting the cost of uh, carbon, uh, carbon, uh, carbon uh, emissions in Europe at 73 euro per ton, and you calculate the, the, the carbon credits that can be derived from 100,000 megawatts, uh, I think it's just finances itself just from carbon credits. Um, any 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 comment on the on the setting up of the Southern African Power Pool, which then includes the Congo River and all the rivers in the DRC as part of this Southern African Power Water Pool? Uh, you, are, you, are, you are muted, uh, Doctor. Okay. I think it's the organizer that has muted. Wait, wait, yes. uh, wait, okay. Thank you very much for the, the question. Uh, uh, for me, I'll go with two, two uh, ways here. First of all, uh, water is life, as they say. 
I, I remember that the, in South Africa, University of Cape Town, they, there was some a professor and students, they are working on the device how to disanalyze the water from the ocean. Uh, because uh, South Africa got a lot of water. Uh, I'm, I'm talking about Southern, Southern Africa countries. They got a lot of water around. I think the, 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 the best way to do things, uh, first of all, is to see where research can bring us. Because we have a lot of water around uh, the Southern Africa countries. That will be the first one because we cannot have a sustainable or we cannot have a sustainable development without putting something down in research. Research is a way to go as well. Uh, that is the first thing. The second thing, yeah, if for instance we we uh, inside the community we want to survive, we we need to create equilibrium between members of the team because we have already SADEC, we have South, Af South African Power Pool, we can have South African Water Pool. Um, as the family um, links uh, going to be grown and grown and grown up, that is a, a, another way to go in order to um, uh, strengthen our, our relationship between uh, nation, between the, the SADEC region. Uh, that is uh, the second thing. Uh, I think you asked me about the, you calculate uh, the, the, the mission. Uh, I know that there is a mechanism in DRC Congo which are uh, currently um, try to quantify the, 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 the quantity of uh, the, the COD, uh, the COD um, uh, taken by the all the trees and so on in order to charge it's true that uh, those money can can finance a lot of projects but remember in DRC Congo there is a lot of priorities and the government tried to divert uh, that uh, that money receive or uh, that's gonna receive in many uh, many others priorities for me I say okay we we, we like in DRC Congo we're moving up and up um, as um, Alex uh, presented, is uh, sometimes a way to go. We have a lot of mining companies which are uh, in need of uh, power. They can move forward, say, okay, look, uh, we need power. And there must be people to make them understand that they need power, we can provide them. They need to be a mechanism to make them understanding. Because most of the time, there's people who got money, they don't know where to put that money. Yeah, true. In DRC Congo, there is a lot of projects that can uh, help to enable a lot of uh, uh, companies. But is the companies to do a step forward, as well as the politician to make that happen, as well as engineers to move forward in order to uh, to 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 shake uh, things to happen. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Uh, Chair, thank you. I just had uh, a couple of points uh, just to supplement what uh, Daniel, uh, Dr. Daniel has just said. Okay. Well, well, well first of all, I'll, I'll touch on the desalination point. Uh, we've built a lot of desalination plants in the Middle East for fresh water. And if we look at the, the, the cost of building it, because most desalination plants have got a generation capacity to it as well, because you're creating super steam and then you're producing power. And uh, none of those projects have ever uh, been recovered in terms of cost return, because uh, it just doesn't make sense. Because you're either burning heavy fuels, which again is a, is not addressing the issue. Okay, so uh, and most of the power that is generated in that part of the world, apart from the gas element of it, I'd say 40% is actually through heavy fuels and through desalination in in a nutshell. So. I think in the case of South Africa, if it, the cost of building a 600 or a 700 megawatt power station that's doing desalination in in Qatari reals or in US dollar terms is about 800 to a billion dollars. Now, to me, 800 to a billion dollars invested in something like Southern African water pool, eight, you know, 800 million can go a long way to addressing 
some of these issues. And it's not saying we are going to invest that money all at one time, but you need to start building it from a scalable point of view that makes sense. So that's from a desalination point. The other point I just wanted to add was around the carbon footprints and you know the carbon credits. Uh, unless it's someone coming from Europe, no one in Africa wants to believe them. We as Africans are not mature enough. That is one. But I don't think it's a maturity issue in my view. I think it is companies that come into Africa, commercialize that to their own benefit and take 80% of the returns of that investment for their own needs. And this is purely consulting. They're not building anything. But they are coming from reputable organizations, whether it be MIT or University of Aberdeen, and that paradigm has to be changed. But that can only be changed from a government level, working with ghost governments to come to that balance. Because I can tell you this much, if I factor in the cost of a carbon footprint credit into a financial model of a power station, whether it be coal, my buyback period is cut by 35%. So that tells you that uh, sometimes there is no incentive even from the West to want to help that. They will rather take those credits and sell them for something else. But that's another tapped area that I believe if you kind of look at Southern water pool, uh, Southern African energy pool, combine those two, you can have another trading platform that purely just deals on African carbon credits, footprints, and ESGs that could also generate money, and people will put money into that. Thank you. Thanks, Alex. Uh, just to give figures, uh, um, the the uh, the Southern African power pool has got a grid grid emissions factor. So the what what it what it was in 2021 because it expired in 2021. It was 0 0.9091 uh, tons of CO2 reductions per megawatt hour. Okay, so if you take a hundred thousand megawatts at a load factor, now I'm, I'm now being very conservative because of climate change, of course. So let me say a hundred thousand megawatts of the of the Congo River, but but the Congo River is big. But anyway, let me let me give a 50% load factor, okay? So uh, 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 100,000 megawatts at a load factor of 50% gives roughly about 400 million tons per annum of carbon dioxide uh, emissions reductions or carbon credits. Now, look, the guys in Europe have said we, they want to get down to net zero by 2020, but, sorry, 2050. Which means you can forward sell uh, this this 400 million uh, for for the next what 10 years or so, and I mean that's where the money should be coming from. And as Alex said, <laughs> this information is in Africa, but the Africans actually don't even want to hear about it, and unless someone from Europe actually comes in and tells us that yes, you've got the money, but he's not going to do that because he doesn't want to pay you what it should really be costing costing because the, the cost of our carbon credits in africa must be at our cost no, no, not at someone's costs uh, because they know what they, they, they they're, tr they're trying to do now uh, i think to, to to wrap off this uh, this uh, this interesting session um prof naidu uh, you, you 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 are the uh, you are the instigator the initiator of this concept of the Southern African water pool. And I think um, from what you've heard from the panelists and the questions that have been asked, um, I would like you to uh, give us uh, your, your views um, as to the theme of this particular uh, session of uh, the Southern African power pool as a solution to the water crisis that is in front of us. Oh, okay. Uh, Prof. Naidu, oh, I'm, 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 I'm sorry. Uh, Prof. Naidu, 
uh, had earlier on indicated that his, his load shedding starts at 12. So he's actually out because of load shedding. Uh, uh, yeah, so I think it's one of the things that we need. <laughs> it's, it's, it's a practical example of what we need to do as Africans. But because I, I think you are also aware, uh, the engineer Mnodawafa mentioned of 71 billion offered by, by China. And the British and Americans and, and, and the European Germans and French have given South Africa 8.5 billion to move away from coal. And I'm not sure whether that 8.5 billion is going to be used at all because no one is coming up with how to use it. But I think from, from what we've discussed, we know how to use it, isn't it? And in fact, we don't even need it because we can raise more than 8.5 billion uh, ourselves using our own, our own resources from what we've actually just been, been talking about. Uh, so with that, I have taken a lot of uh, people's time. I would like uh, to thank all my panelists uh, for the uh, excellent presentations. And I would like to thank the attendees that are still with us uh, for bearing with me, uh, you know, taking your time. Uh, but I think you, you, you need to take heart that we are onto a good thing. We are aware of where we are and we are aware of where we are going. We have engineering problems. Uh, which need engineering solutions. And with Alex's help, we will also find the financial solutions to implement the engineering solutions. So I'd like to thank you uh, very much, all of you. Uh, we've come to the end of this session. Uh, over to you, uh, Minx. Thank you very much, Francis, and thank you very much for hosting this webinar today so efficiently. Thank you to all our panelists and last but not least our attendees. Thank you for availing yourself. Please visit the SIE website. You will see the registration links to day two and day three, um, tomorrow and Thursday. Start at 10 a.m. promptly until 1 p.m. Um, all of our panelists, thank you very much for availing yourselves. Have a good afternoon wherever you might be. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you very much.